You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. Got a million better put on the road. I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the seventh part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. To say that Izuku had had an interesting night would be a colossal understatement. He'd gone on his first date, rescued a little girl who might have been kidnapped, and fought one of those possibly responsible for said kidnapping. He had thought that waiting for Nezu to get back to him about Ari's fate would be the hardest thing to deal with. Unfortunately, he had forgotten about his mother. Izuku, baby, are you okay? Inko somehow managed to hug him and shake him at the same time. She was also successfully inspecting him for injuries, despite her eyes being filled with tears. MF fine, mom, Izuku gasped out and tried not to look embarrassed, because his girlfriend of two hours was looking far too amused. Iri, who sat next to Yuraraka, just looked confused. To her, it looked like Izuku was getting attacked, but no one was worried, and Izuku's attacker seemed to be concerned for him. A police officer, who had been silently enjoying this in the corner, finally took pity on Izuku and gently pried his mother off to explain the situation. After about 15 minutes, Inko returned and gave her son a much gentler hug. I am so proud of you, she said, and then wiped away more tears. What you did was incredibly brave. She then turned to the other teenager in the room. And you must be your Raka chan Izuku has told me so much about you, but I wasn't expecting to meet you so soon, or under these circumstances. Iraraka wasn't expecting to be the center of attention especially by her boyfriend's mother and quickly sketched a bow. H hello, Midoriya-san. It's nice to meet you. Inko beamed. So polite, and a sweetheart, from what Izuku's told me. Mom, sorry. Inko's tone and expression said that she was anything but sorry. Anyway, I'm so glad that you're both alright. She saw Iri and smiled kindly. And I'm very glad that you're okay too. Iri, who was extremely confused, just nodded shyly. She looked close to being overwhelmed, and had made a habit of clinging on to her rescuers when they sat next to her. The clinging got worse when Nezu arrived in person a short while later to discuss the matter with the police. No one could blame her, Nezu was unusual, even in this day and age. Less than an hour went by, and then Nezu returned with a kind smile on his face. Hello, Iri-chan. My name is Nezu, and I am the principal of UA High. It's a school that trains students to be heroes. Your two friends here are among the top of their class. Fury blinked. She didn't really know what top of the class meant. But from the way Inko beamed, it was obviously good. Iraraka and Izuku would have blushed at the praise. But they had been red-faced since she'd caught them kissing anyway. Now, I understand that you've had a hard time. Nezu went on. But I've spoken to the police, and until we are absolutely sure that you can live a safe and happy life, we've decided to let you stay at my school. And no, Iri jolted back and tried to hide in her chair. I can't be near people. I h hurt them. I'm cursed. Izuku wondered what she meant by that, but then assumed it had something to do with her quirk. Nezu's smile turned sad, and he reached up to gently put a paw on her knee. Is that what the bad men told you? Iri hadn't expected that reaction at all. Neither had Yuraraka or Inko. Only Izuku did, and that was because Nezu's story was unique enough to catch his attention. Animals with quirks were extremely rare, and one that made said animal even more intelligent than a human was practically unheard of. Nezu had been captured by a radical group of quirk-obsessed scientists, and experimented on, until he'd been rescued by a group of heroes. If anyone was going to bond with Iri over shared trauma, it would be him, and Izuku knew it. They did, Iri said softly. H how did you know? Because bad men told me the same thing. He and Iri were both small enough to fit on the same chair, so that's what he did. And do you know what I did? I proved them wrong. It was hard, and it took a long time. But now, I'm proud of what I can do. Someday, I'm sure you'll be the same. And we'll be there to help you, Izuku promised, and gently rested his hand on her head. Right, Achako? Of course we will. Yuraraka smiled at the little girl. Helping people is what heroes do. And it's what my school does, Nezu added. Iri-chan, UA is the perfect place to teach you how to safely use your quirk. And since Midoriya-san and Yuraraka-san are there six days every week, 
you'll be able to see them very often. Izuku and Yuraraka were starting to realize that they'd volunteered for something major. On top of their own studies and training, they now had to help a girl work past her trauma, her self-esteem issues, and teach her how to use her quirk. And they didn't even know what her quirk was. Still, looking at the little girl who clung to them like a lifeline, how could they say no? After some cajoling from Izuku and Yuraraka, Iri was convinced to go with Nezu and a heavy police escort to Yue to spend the night. She had only reluctantly agreed when they promised that they would see her the next morning, and as often as possible. It was only after she was gone that they both realized how exhausted they were and nearly collapsed in the hospital. A police officer was asked to drive Yuraraka to her apartment, and another would escort the Midoriyas to their own home. There was only a short pause before they split up, where Izuku and Yuraraka stood awkwardly. Um, Yuraraka rubbed the back of her head. Good night, Deku-kun. Good night, Achako-chan. Izuku tried very hard not to turn, because he just knew his mother was watching. Instead, he hugged his new girlfriend and kissed her on the cheek. See you tomorrow. After everything that's happened, you really have to ask. Iroraka hugged him back. If I don't keep an eye on you, you'll probably get abducted by a wizard or something. Don't jinx it, Izuku warned as he stepped back. He was about to rejoin his mother when he felt soft lips press against his cheek. W what was that for? That was because I've wanted to kiss you since the sports festival, Yuraraka admitted. Also, because you're really cute. Izuku sputtered, but could only stand there as Yuraraka skipped off to the waiting police cruiser. As she was driven away, he jumped when his mother patted him on the shoulder. She's a good one, Inko said with a teasing smile. She reminds me of a few times when I'd just started dating your father, and I would. Hey, mom, I have to get to UA kind of early tomorrow morning, can we go home? The last thing Izuku wanted to know was intimate details of his parents' love life. Inko's smile never wavered, but her teasing did. Of course, honey, let's go home. Chisaki Kai was furious, short of being captured by the authorities. This was the absolute worst thing to happen to him. His plan, his life's goal, hinged on Iri, and now she was gone in the hands of the heroes, where she would inevitably be infected by their disease. He had no idea where she was, and he couldn't assume that they would be stupid enough to put her somewhere she could be easily retaken. He also had no idea if they knew what Iri could do. If they did, they'd spirit her away to the ends of the earth if it meant propagating their disease. Chisaki looked down at his gloved hands, slowly clenching and unclenching them as he considered his next move. Unfortunately, there was only one option for the immediate future. Hirono. Hirono Hari known to most as Chronostasis stepped out of the shadows. Yes, overhaul. Increase the sale of trigger, we need to build up capital faster. As soon as we get Eri back, we'll need to make up for lost time. Understood. Chronostasis paused. Do we have any leads on her location? Not yet, Chisaki growled. And depending on where she is, we'll have to be careful on how to proceed. If we move too early or hit them too hard, we could bring the police and the heroes down on our heads before we're ready. I'll have some guys search where she went missing, Chronostasis promised. Good. The thought of heroes and their sickness made Chisaki want to throw up. Notify me if anything changes on either front. For now, I'm going to wash my hands. When Midoriya and Yuraraka arrived at UA the next morning, they were happy to see their friends including the big three but took them aside to let them know what had happened. They didn't want them to freak out around Iri, who was certainly still on edge. Let me get this straight, Ashido said, as serious as anyone had ever seen her. You guys went out on your date, had a wonderful time and somehow managed to end with a fight, a rescue, and a hospital stay. She glared at Yuraraka's bandaged arm. Midori, you're dragging your girlfriend into your messes now. Siro chuckled. I hate to say it, dude, but you're cursed. You can't go anywhere without something happening. Yuraraka felt obliged to defend her new boyfriend. Hey, bad things only happened to just him once. Every other time, at least one of us was with him. She's right, Ribbit, Asui agreed. The curse has already spread to us all. Hato laughed, while Amajiki leaned away from Midoriya as if he really believed he was cursed. Tagata, on the other hand, slung an arm around Midoriya's shoulders. Still, you two did good work, he said. You saved someone, you did it inside the law, and no one got seriously hurt. Sir Nidai once told me that that kind of day is the best outcome for a hero. Iroraka and Midoriya blushed under the praise, but the latter was just glad that the big three were interacting with him again. After telling them the truth about the Ultimatrix and Quirk shortly after his first friends, they had withdrawn from him for a while. Tagata had later told him that they had wanted to discuss the matter amongst themselves, and then had to process everything they'd learned. For his part, Tagata had actually been fascinated with the idea of Quirk's being given to people, though he didn't say why. 
Hotto thought being part alien was awesome. The only downside was that she couldn't tell anyone and couldn't believe that other people wouldn't think it was as cool. Amajiki, on the other hand, had been thoroughly shaken by what he'd learned. Only a tight hug from Hotto and encouraging words from Tagata had prevented him from descending into a panic attack. He looked better now, but Midoriya didn't miss the way Hotto kept glancing at him, as if she was gauging his state of mind. Anyway, about Iri, Midoriya said, trying to get them all on track. Can you guys hang back a little while Achako and I talk to her? I don't want her getting overwhelmed by a bunch of strangers. Yeyurazu nodded. That's probably for the best. She can sit and watch us train if she doesn't want to talk. Or maybe we can introduce ourselves one at a time. Either way, we should be really gentle with her, Yuraraka said, then gave Ashido and Ida pointed looks. Don't be hyper, and don't do that hand choppy thing you do. Ashido stuck her tongue out, but didn't actually disagree. Fine, but can we go inside now? I want to see what this training Midori hyped up is all about. The students went inside and got changed into their gym uniforms. Waiting for them in the gym was Nezu, Yuri, and to everyone's surprise, Aizawa. Yuri, now wearing an adorable red dress and pink blouse, broke away from Nezu and ran to her rescuers as soon as she saw them. You came back. Midoriya crouched so that he could look her in the eye. Of course we did. We promised, right? Yuri nodded. Right she looked up at the small crowd of strangers that were keeping their distance, but smiling. Um, these are our friends, Uri-chan, Yuraraka said gently. I promise, they're all super nice, but if you don't want to meet them today, that's fine. Uri nodded again, and then hid behind Nezu as he joined them. Aizawa and I will keep an eye on her while you all train, Nezu said. If we need any of you, we'll let you know. Thank you, Nezu-sensei. Midoriya glanced at his sleepy-eyed homeroom teacher. Why is Aizawa-sensei here? Uri looked ashamed as Nezu explained. Uri-chan had a bit of an episode last night. Her quirk activated. Her horn grew and began to glow. She insisted that no one touch her, and I became concerned that her quirk would cause harm. Aizawa happened to be on campus last night and erased her quirk. He'll be here in case it happens again. See, Uri-chan. Midoriya smiled at the little girl. UA is a great place, and the teachers are here to help, just like us. Iri wiped away her tears, but jumped when Aizawa gently put a hand on her head. I'll take her off to the side. You all should get to your training. Thanks, Aizawa-sensei. Midoriya and Yuraraka rejoined their friends, all of whom waved at Iri as they left. You two are in so much trouble, Ashido hissed. You didn't say she was adorable. You didn't ask, Yuraraka teased. Ashido glared at her. First round, you and me. Yuraraka grinned cockily. Bring it on. There wasn't much actual structure to the training. Tagata advised that they all work on whatever they felt they were weakest in, or otherwise exercise their quirks to strengthen them. After that, Tagata had practically dragged Midoriya away for a spar which mostly meant that Midoriya would be spending the next three hours failing to even hit the upperclassmen. Unless, I see that look, freshman, Tagata said with a grin. You've got an idea on how to fight me. I think so. Midoriya cycled through his aliens and it felt so good to actually call them aliens, at least when he was with his friends until he found what he wanted. I want to try it, anyway. Hey, that's why you're here, right? Tagata stretched for a minute and then took a ready stance. Bring it on. Midoriya pressed the dial. When the green light faded, Shocksquatch crossed his arms. Come and get me, eh? I've gotta ask, how come your accent changes? Tagata looked a little confused. I mean, I get that your voice would change, but why the accents? Shouldn't you still have a Japanese accent? Shocksquatch opened his mouth, then closed it again. Huh? I don't actually know, eh? Maybe transforming rewrites my brain. Tagata shrugged. It's as good an explanation as any. So, you ready to go? Oh, yeah. Shocksquatch cracked his knuckles, and electricity sparked along his fur. Golden energy surged around Tagata's body. Shocksquatch wasn't sure, but he thought he felt a small tremor in the ground. Tagata shot forwards, as expected, but rather than try to dodge, Shocksquatch waited. He would need to time this right, or he wouldn't get another chance. Tagata was too skilled to get tricked more than once. Just before Tagata's fist connected, Shocksquatch expanded an aura of electricity to just above his skin. The punch still hurt, and he was almost knocked clear out of the ring. But Tagata fell to one knee. His aura faded, and his muscles locked up from the electricity. He didn't look hurt, but he was definitely surprised. Shocksquatch didn't have much time. The paralysis wouldn't last very long. He got up as quickly as his winded body allowed, and threw a haymaker. To his surprise and pride, he finally landed a solid blow on his opponent that sent him cartwheeling back. Tagata landed with a solid thud, but as he got to his feet, he saw Shocksquatch pointing at something behind him. 
Tagata looked and saw that one foot was just outside the boundaries. It was only a technicality, but Tagata had lost. Midoriya transformed back to normal. His chest hurt, but he didn't care. Not only had he managed to hit Tagata, he had won the fight. Not bad, freshman. Tagata didn't look disappointed. If anything, he was proud. I was so surprised that I lost track of my surroundings. It's been a long time since I've taken a hit like that. TH thanks. Midoriya shook his head. Are you okay? Oh, I'm fine. Tagata grinned. No offense, but you didn't actually hit me that hard. Why don't you heal up, and we can go again? Midoriya nodded. Sure. In the observation room, Iri looked on in concern. Why are they fighting? Nezu chuckled. They aren't actually fighting, Iri-chan. This is training they're helping each other become stronger. Iri nodded, but she didn't seem to understand. Why are they doing that? Because it will make them better heroes, and that means that they can help more people like you and stop bad people. Iri seemed to accept this, but she still flinched when Midoriya Shocksquatch once again was sent flying from Tagata's kick. Don't worry, Aizawa said. We'll make sure no one gets hurt. His words were said dryly, but the simple logic was enough to get Iri to calm down. Still, Nezu noticed that her attention was mainly focused on two students in particular. He wasn't surprised. Midoriya and Yuroraka had saved her, and were likely the first people she could remember to show her any real kindness. He just hoped that the two were prepared for the kind of responsibility they'd taken on. Aren't you going to spar, Momo? Yeyurazu smiled at her older friend. No, not today, Nejire. I'm working on improving the speed of my quirk. Creating more complicated objects can take too long, especially in a situation where time is of the essence. Hado hovered over the other girl and smiled. So, what are you making? Yeyurazu sat down and opened up her gym shirt. I'm thinking something with circuitry. If I can make something as advanced as a functioning computer, I'll try to cut down how long it takes to make it. Cool. Hado flipped around. I'm gonna go practice with Sue, it's gonna be such a fun game of tag. Siro ducked under a punch. Hey, Tenya. Ida backed up, then jabbed out again. He was trying to spar with his arms, only using his kicks for an attack he was sure would connect. What is it? Am I Siro paused, and his hesitation nearly got him punched square in the face. Am I not good enough a fighter? Now it was Ida's turn to pause. How do you mean? I mean, Izuku's got his transformations. Shoto is a walking disaster. Anyone Momo can't beat up. She can make something to beat them up with, and you can kick through solid stone. I just shoot tape. Ida would have asked why Siro didn't include Asui, Yuraka, or Ashido in his little rant, but the four he did mention were widely regarded as some of the best students in their class. In Ida's opinion, Siro was setting the bar a little too high. I do not think that it is a matter of you being good enough, Ida said carefully, painfully aware that this sort of thing was not his forte. Perhaps you should stop comparing yourself to those of us who specialize in combat. I mean no offense, but raw power is not your strong suit. If you want to be better at fighting, maybe you should work on your agility. I know from experience that it is better to avoid being hit in the first place and maybe you could ask the support department about equipment to increase your damage output. Ciro held up a hand to pause the spar, like reinforce boots or something. I could do some damage if I built up momentum by swinging on my tape and kicking. Exactly. Ida was proud that he was able to help his friend, but knew when to quit when he was ahead. You should probably speak to Izuku about this, as this sort of thing is his specialty, right? Siro grinned and rubbed the back of his head. I bet he's got a whole notebook on how to help me improve. Ida nodded. As a matter of fact, it might be a good idea for all of us to ask for his input. He glanced at their green-haired friend, who was currently getting thrashed by Tagata, or after he recovers. Todoroki frowned as he tried to land a hit on Amajiki. The older boy was fast, and had amazing versatility with his quirk. It was almost like fighting Midoriya, only without the long-ranged attacks. He could still reach far with those tentacles, but there was a limit. On the other hand, he was fast enough to dodge Todoroki's ice, and whenever he got close, he just turned his hands into clamshells that smashed through it, assisted by octopus muscle in his arms. He wouldn't admit it, but thinking about all the seafood Amajiki had eaten was starting to make him hungry. After training, he was going to get a nice lunch. Food made him think about cooking and cooking made him think about fire. Were he anyone else, he would have slapped himself. He was still falling into the mindset of only using his ice. He'd made progress, but old habits were hard to break. Amajiki barely had time to turn his arms into wings and fly away to avoid a torrent of fire. Hey, watch it. Sorry, I just thought I'd take this seriously. Amajiki landed, and his arms turned into tentacles again. Yeah, but with fire, you have to be careful about your surroundings. You should know that better than most, being Endeavor's son and all. 
As much as he hated his father, Todoroki couldn't help but be reminded of something Endeavor had said during a recent training. Fire is wild and dangerous, he had warned. Once it leaves your body, it is difficult to control, and after it begins to feed, that tenuous grip is gone. You must be aware of everything around you, or you risk injuring or even killing someone by accident. It is why I rarely fight even close to my full power, especially not in an urban area. If you must fight at your maximum, be sure it is outside of a populated area, or wait until confirmation that civilians have been evacuated. With a thought, Todoroki's fire shrank to a few small jets around his forearm. You're right, maybe I should use my fire defensively. I could create small bursts of flame whenever someone gets close. Not a bad idea. There aren't too many villains who charge through fire, and that hesitation could leave them open to you freezing them. Todoroki appreciated the advice, though he wished Amajiki could say so without hiding in the corner. Ashido and Yuraraka were at a stalemate. It was obvious that the latter's fighting abilities had improved, but the former was keeping out of reach, though she didn't want to use her acid on her friend. Instead, she skated around Yuraraka, looking for an opening. So, Achako, Ashido said playfully, Other than saving Uri, how'd your date go? It was good. Yuraraka replied almost absently, she was focused on the fight. We had dinner, then a nice walk on the beach. And then we beat up that creep who tried to take Uri. Come on, you have to give me more than that. Ashido pouted, then gracefully flipped out of the way when Yuraraka got a little too close. Did he confess his undying love for you? Did you confess your undying love for him? At least tell me you kissed. We did, Yuraraka admitted. A couple of times. Ooh, how was it? Was there tongue, or just woe? In her excitement, Ashido had gotten a little distracted. That had been enough of an opening for Yuraraka to get in close and hit her square in the gut with an open palm. Ashido felt the air rush from her lungs. She doubled over, but instead of falling on her face, she simply floated in midair. Yuraraka then grabbed her by the arm. All I have to do is push you up, and you float to the ceiling. Ashido guessed that that would be a 40-foot drop, at least. Of course, she knew that Yuraraka would make sure she came back down safely, but the message was clear. Yeah, okay, I give. Yuraraka sighed, and then pressed her fingertips together. Release. Ashido landed gracefully. Damn, girl, Gun had really taught you some stuff, huh? Now that the rush of fighting was gone, Yuraraka just rubbed the back of her head in embarrassment. I guess I kinda threw myself into training. Did you also throw yourself at Midori? Ashido grinned when Yuraraka sputtered. Come on, don't tell you didn't pretend to trip and let him catch you, that's a classic. Do you want me to send you into space? Because I will send you into space. Only if you manage to hit me again. Ashido's grin took on a more challenging look. Ready for round two. After three hours of work, the students asked if they could stick around a little longer so that Iri could spend more time with them. Nezu readily agreed and set them up in an empty classroom. Aizawa joined them, but rather than actually interact, he just crawled into his sleeping bag and closed his eyes. The students, now in their school uniforms, formed a loose semicircle around Iri. For her part, the little girl was a little less wary. After all, Yuraraka and Midoriya were happy when they were around, which, to her, meant that they probably weren't bad. So, Iri-chan, what do you think of Yue so far? Hato's words were much softer than usual, but her smile never wavered. Iri shyly hid behind Midoriya. It's big and bright. The first part of the comment made sense nearly all of them had been impressed by UAS entrance on their first day on campus but the second part confused them. Before any of them could ask, Iri kept speaking. The place with the B-bad people was dark. It was so dark, and I. Iri choked and stumbled back, her horn started to glow and grew several inches. Her eyes went wide in fear, especially when Midoriya reached for her. And no, get away. Just as the light started to get brighter, it abruptly vanished, and her horn shrank. Midoriya turned and saw Aizawa looking at her, his own quirk erasing hers. Her quirk seems to trigger when she's stressed, Aizawa said, once he was sure that Iri was in control again. Try to keep things positive for her, until she's able to handle what happened, or at least until she can control her quirk. Yes, Aizawa sensei. Midoriya knelt in front of Iri and smiled. Sorry about that. Are you feeling better? Iri rubbed her horn with one hand, and her teary eyes with the other. I th think so. Hey, Iri-chan. Hado waved excitedly, but kept an uncharacteristic distance. Hi, I'm Hado Nejire, but you can just call me Nejire. Iri hid behind Midoriya, but tentatively waved back. She then jumped when most of the girls cooed over how cute she was. Guys, what did we say? 
Yuraka hissed, even though she was just as guilty over the cooing. Sorry, sorry. Hado kept her gaze fixed on Iri. Anyway, Iri-chan, I just wanted to know if you wanted to hear some funny stories. Funny stories are a great way to make new friends. The other students had a sneaking suspicion that Hado really meant embarrassing stories, but if it made Iri more comfortable around them, they'd grin and bear it, especially when Iri nodded. Boo, I've got one, Yuraka said. I can tell you about the first time I accidentally made my dad float, and he pretended to swim through the air. Tagata laughed. I remember one time when I used my quirk and accidentally launched myself out of my house. It wouldn't have been so bad if I'd had clothes, or if there weren't 50 people walking down the street. And so time passed, with each of them sharing an embarrassing story of how they accidentally used their quirks, from Ida using his boosters while on a freshly mopped floor, to Ashido melting a hole in her room that resulted in her falling from the second story to the first, right onto her couch. Iri never smiled during the stories, but she did start to relax. Eventually, she was confident enough to sit in Midoriya's lap instead of hiding behind him, though she did hold on to Yuraka's hand the entire time. Yuraka didn't mind, since she took the opportunity to lean against her boyfriend. None of them noticed Ashido take a quick picture with her phone, and saved it under cute things that will make me die. Finally, it got late enough that the students had to go home. Most of them left, save for Midoriya and Yuraka, who had to tell Iri that, yes, they would have to leave, but they would be back on Monday. Midoriya promised that if she needed to talk to him before then, Nezu had his phone number, which seemed to satisfy the little girl. Do you think she'll be okay? Yuraka asked as they walked to the train station. I hope so. Midoriya looked down at the ground. She's been through things I don't even want to think about, and she's definitely still scared. Well, of course she's scared. She was being held prisoner until yesterday. Yuraka fumed. I hope the heroes and the police catch whoever hurt her soon. If I ever meet him, I'm gonna make him float into the sun. Only if I don't squish him as way big, Midoriya growled, but then shook off his anger. Let's try not to think about that right now. Yeah, you're right. Iraraka leaned in and kissed him on the cheek. There, now I feel better. W, why do you K keep doing that? Iraraka smiled teasingly. What? I'm not allowed to kiss my boyfriend. At least give me a warning or something. Or me, Ben added from inside the Ultimatrix. Seriously, let me know if you're gonna smack lips. I feel like a voyeur. Oops. Iraraka giggled. Sorry, Ben. Apology Ak Ak accepted. The couple froze. Ben, what was that? Midoriya demanded. There was brief pause before Ben answered. Sorry, minor audio fault. I need to defrag more often. Yuraka frowned. It sounded plausible, but something made her suspect it was untrue. Still, she had no proof. If you're sure, I am. Ben's tone changed to something more upbeat. By the way, Izuku, with everything that happened last night, I never got a chance to give you something for what you did for Iri. His hologram appeared, but only for Midoriya. Check it out a new alien. Midoriya held up the watch and activated it. Sure enough, there was an image of a large beetle-like creature with a horn. What's this one? He's called Edel, Ben explained. Pretty strong, pretty tough, and he can eat through almost anything. Oh, and he can use what he eats to fuel an energy beam from his horn. That's so cool. Midoriya's mind raced, and he quickly got out his ever-present notebook. He's obviously good in a fight, but I could use that power to clear away rubble that's close, and then shoot away anything that might collapse on bystanders. Yuraka giggled as her boyfriend rambled. She put aside thoughts of evil criminals and lying holograms for now, and just enjoyed the moment. The following week, Class 1A threw itself into training even more than before. If the students weren't working on their quirks, they were studying. Ashido in particular looked frazzled by the tutoring Ye Yurazu put her through. But she pressed on. Out of all the rising stars, she was the most excited for the summer training camp and she wasn't about to miss out on it. It wasn't just the rising stars who studied together, several other students asked Yeyarazu for tutoring, and she was more than happy to help. A minor thing that changed for the students not unexpected, but it was a small and temporary hiccup in their daily routines was that their uniforms changed. As June rolled into July, heavy jackets were discarded and long-sleeved shirts were replaced with short-sleeved versions. For the most part, nothing changed, though there was brief disturbance when Minda made a scene about the girls not wearing such modest jackets. Asui quickly smacked him for his ogling. One thing that bothered Midoriya was the upcoming practical exam. There was no hint about what it entailed, and it was starting to drive him crazy. He liked to be prepared for things, but there was nothing to prepare for. He had just said as much to his friends during lunch on Friday, when he heard footsteps behind him. Oh, is the mighty class worried over the exams? Midoriya turned to see a boy with blonde hair and eyes that gleamed with malice sneering down at him. 
and you all like to hold yourselves over the rest of us when you're clearly just a bucket of nerves. How sad. It just goes to show how inferior you all are to Irk. A swift chop to the back of his head sent Mono Manito of Class 1B collapsing in a heap. Kendo then lifted him up by his collar. Sorry about that, she said. I've been trying to keep him out of your hair for a while, but he gave me the slip. From the exasperated looks of other 1B students across the cafeteria, Midoriya assumed that this behavior was something they had to deal with on a regular basis. If Kendo was trying to change Monoma's attitude with physical discipline, it wasn't working. It's F fine, Kendo-san, he said. Thanks, though. Kendo shrugged. No problem. Hey, are you guys worried about the practical? Yeyurazu nodded. Yes, it's difficult to prepare for something when it could literally be anything. I hear you. Kendo sighed, but then perked up. Hey, I did hear something about it from a friend a year ahead of me. They said the practical exams usually have us fighting big robots, like the ones from the entrance exam. Ashido grinned. Really? Oh, that's awesome. It was kind of fun fighting those things before, and we're a lot stronger now. That makes sense, Midoriya mumbled. They'd want us to show how much we've grown, so going all out against robots would help them gauge how well we've improved. Kendo raised an eyebrow. Is he always like this? Pretty much, Siro admitted. At least he's not going on about quirks he could do that for hours. Well, have fun with that. Kendo turned and headed back to her table, still dragging Monoma across the floor. Good luck with the exams. Robots, huh? Asui tapped her chin. That might be hard for someone without a combat-focused quirk, Ribbit. Obviously, our teachers would want us to push our quirks and our minds to their limits, without worrying about hurting someone. Ida chopped at the air decisively. Such a comprehensive test, as expected of UA. Yuraka nodded, but then she glanced at the time. Hey, Deku-kun, do you want to say hi to Iri before lunch is over? Midoriya put aside his empty tray and stood up. Yeah, we haven't seen her since this morning. The two hurried off, and Ashido groaned. It's not fair. They get to spend time with that little angel, and we can't. She doesn't trust us yet, Todoroki pointed out. But at least she doesn't hide from us as much. Yeah, but she's so cute. And she has a horn. I have horns. We're destined to be horn buddies, and I am being kept from my destiny. Yayurazu giggled at her friend's antics. It was like watching a little kid being kept from a new toy. She didn't blame her, though, since Ari was the sweetest thing but she was obviously still traumatized. Iri was only letting Midoriya and Yuraraka in right now, but the hope was that she would get better. All they could do was take things slow. Two weeks later, Midoriya flopped onto his bed and didn't move. Tomorrow was the day of the written exams, and the practicals were three days after that. He and his friends had buckled down on their studies, to the point where even Yeyurazu was mentally exhausted. It didn't help that the only thing they knew about the practicals was that it involved robots. For all they knew, the test was about not fighting them, or fighting them a certain way, or... Buddy, calm down, Ben said. I can practically see your blood pressure going up. Sorry, Midoriya said, his voice muffled by the pillow covering his face. I'm just nervous. Dude, you fought villains, a serial killer, and traveled to another universe. You can handle whatever gets thrown your way. Thanks, it's why I'm here, pointing out the obvious as a primary subroutine. Midoriya shifted just enough to give the hologram a side eye. I don't believe you. It's true. The real Ben was worried that the next user might be as boneheaded as he was, so he had that subroutine added. Ben tilted his head. You just got a message on your phone. Midoriya pulled out his phone. Sure enough, Yuraraka had just sent him a message. Comet, good luck, Deku-kun. Zoxo, all might, can I get those in real life tomorrow? I think I'm gonna need it. Comet, not as much as I will. All Might, you'll be fine, Achako. Comet, how do you know? All Might, because I'm dating the most amazing girl in the world, and she wouldn't fail. There was a long pause, and Midoriya wondered if he'd done something wrong. Comet, I am going to kiss you so much tomorrow. Night, I think I'm starting to get the hang of having a girlfriend, Midoriya thought, as he went to sleep. The next day, Midoriya met his friends outside of class. All of them were nervous, though Todoroki and Asui hit it best, while Ishido was close to having a meltdown. Yeyorazu was quick to reassure her that she had definitely improved enough to pass the written test. Surprisingly, Todoroki also offered quiet support, even awkwardly patting her on the shoulder, which triggered a fit of giggles from everyone else. Tension lifted, at least a little, they entered the class. Everyone sit down, Aizawa said sternly. Get your pencils out, and pray that you studied enough. The next three days are going to be hell. That was the worst thing ever. Ashido staggered out of the classroom after the third day, and collapsed against Todoroki. I'd rather fight villains any day. 
even the most stoic of the rising stars looked exhausted. Most of the day had been focused on the test, and it had indeed pushed them to their limits. Minoria felt pretty confident about most of his answers, especially the section on heroics, but there was a nagging feeling the back of his head that had him worried. Maybe he'd missed more than he thought, or accidentally mistook one question for another and wrote the answer in the wrong spot. Or, stop that. Deku-kun, Yuraraka said tiredly as she leaned against him. You're doing that thing where you think you did badly. All of her friends stopped and stared at her. How can you tell? Siro asked. His eyes go back and forth like he's reading something. And he bites his lip, Yuraraka said, as if it was obvious. He does that after every test, even when he gets an A. It's a little scary that you know that, Ribbit, Asui said. Yuraraka shrugged. I pay attention to my boyfriend. Let's just say that it's a good way to sharpen her powers of observation. Ye Yurazu said nervously. Anyway, we should all head home. Tomorrow is going to be a big day as well. Can we visit Iri before we go? Ashido pleaded. She's just so cute, and I need my daily dose of adorable. Yuraraka frowned. She's a girl, not a puppy. I know that. She's cuter than a puppy. Honestly, Midoriya and Yuraraka didn't need much prompting to visit Iri, so they all journeyed to the office where she stayed for most of the school day. Aizawa didn't always watch her, especially since everyone took care not to trigger another episode and the teachers took turns. Today, however, she was being watched by someone most of the rising stars didn't know. He was a tall, skinny man, with messy blonde hair and a yellow suit that looked several sizes too large for him. Only Midoriya nearly panicked. What is All Might doing here? And in his true form, does Iri know? If she does, she might tell everyone else. Midoriya had promised not to hide secrets from his friends, but this was different. All Might's condition wasn't his secret to share, and everyone knew not to go around talking about a hero's personal life. All Might looked up from a book with a start and a spurt of blood. Oh, sorry, students, I wasn't aware you were coming. Iri's eyes went wide. Izu, Chaco, as the little girl ran up to them, Midoriya and Yuraraka couldn't help but grin. Iri had some problems saying their full names, so she'd settled on nicknames. Hi, Iri-chan, Yuraraka said. Did you have a good day? Iri nodded. She still didn't smile, but over the last few weeks, she had started to come out of her shell. Oh huh, I was drawing. Mr. Yagi helped. Iyarazu's eyes narrowed slightly. She thought she knew all the faculty at UA, so in her mind, a stranger had been watching Iri. I'm sorry, Yagi-san, I don't believe we've met. I was asked to fill in for All Might to watch the girl. All Might's lie was so casual that even Midoriya thought it sounded real. I work for his agency, you see, and sometimes the big guy needs an extra pair of hands on the home front when he goes out to save the day. He bowed. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself, I'm Yagi Tashinori. The students not in the know accepted that easily enough, after all, UAS security was some of the best in the world, and an infiltrator would have used a lie far less blatant than claiming to work for All Might. Well, thank you for watching Iri, Yagi-san, Todoroki said. Sorry for any inconvenience. Not at all, in fact, with my health, this sort of thing is almost a vacation. All Might smiled down at Iri. She's very well behaved. Iri nodded at him shyly, then turned back to her protectors. Did you have a good day? Aw, oh, thank you for asking. Iraraka gently hugged her. We had a long test today, so we're all tired, but I think we did well. Ashido, sitting across the room, caught Iri's attention. She winked and then pretended to fall asleep. Midoriya decided to see if Iri had indeed gotten better around his friends. Hey, Iri, he said, Mina over there worked really hard. Do you think you could give her a hug? It would make her feel better. Iri looked between Ashido and Midoriya, who nodded encouragingly. She hesitated, then slowly walked over to the pink girl. Everyone held their breath as Iri tentatively wrapped her arms around Ashido's legs. Ashido bit her lip to keep from squealing and sat up to hug her back. This is the best day of my life, she said through the biggest grin any of them had ever seen. Thanks for that, horn buddy. Iri tilted her head. Her hand went to her horn and then reached out for one of the Shido's. There was a muted click, and then Yuraraka put away her phone. Midoriya couldn't stop the tears leaking from his eyes. Progress had been made. Are you ready? Yuraraka asked nervously. Midoriya nodded, though it was hard to see through his trembling. Why, yeah. The two of them were alone, so Yuraraka gave him a quick kiss on the lips. It wasn't just for Midoriya's benefit, since she pulled away with a big smile. Good, so am I, she said, and then put on her new helmet. Shortly after preparing for the exams, Yuraraka had submitted a few changes to her costume. Thankfully, they weren't overly complicated, and were ready in time. The biggest change was her helmet. Rather than expose the top of her head and her chin, it completely covered her head, and her visor didn't extend as far. 
It ended up looking like an angular full-face motorcycle helmet, with a thick antenna-like protrusion on each side. She had also added lightweight pink carbon fiber armor to her shoulders and chest. As a close combat specialist with a growing talent in mobility, she wanted a balance between protection and flexibility. Her wrist guards were slimmer and longer, reaching to just below her elbows. They were almost like van braces, rather than large wristbands. Her boots were also slimmer and segmented at the ankles and knees, allowing her better flexibility. She had mentioned that there was another element she wanted for her costume, but Power Loader wouldn't sign off on it until she had a better handle on her quirk. When her friends had asked what it was going to be, she just smiled and said that she'd been inspired by Midoriya and Yayorazu. Even if the costume was technically incomplete, Midoriya thought it looked cool and had said as much when he first saw it. That had earned him a quick kiss from his girlfriend and some good-natured ribbing from everyone else. Hiroraka wasn't the only one to get an upgrade. Siro now sported iron-soled boots and gloves with reinforced knuckles. He had run the idea by Midoriya, who agreed that he could only take a little extra weight before it impeded his mobility, which was his strength. That was fast, Ashido teased as the couple rejoined them. Not enough time for a full makeout session. Looks like I won the bet, Ciro. Should have known they'd be responsible and stuff before a test, Ciro joked. Look, they're not even blushing. That wasn't true. Midoriya had just pulled his hood low, and Yuraraka had her helmet on. Thankfully, Yeyorazu took pity on them and directed their attention elsewhere. Come on, everyone, she said, trying to convey the authority a class president was supposed to have. We need to meet up with the rest of the class. The other students in class 1A didn't really notice how the eight friends arrived together. It had become common to see them so close. The wall of teachers opposite them, however, shared knowing looks. The rising star's close friendship had been a factor in the upcoming test. So, I assume you all think you know what the test is about? Aizawa asked. Kaminari grinned. We're fighting those robots, right? Just give us that win. Yeah, Ashido cheered. Campfires and S'mores, here we come. Actually, we decided to change things up this year. Nezu surprised them all when he popped out of Aizawa's capture tool. True, using the robots from the entrance exam is a traditional way to gauge how well you've improved since then. But as has been pointed out, pure power is not everyone's forte. As such, we've decided that your opponents will be us. All Might shouted as he fell from the sky and landed in front of the students. He then glanced back at Nezu. Did I get the timing right on that one? Yes, you didn't actually cut me off mid-word this time. Nezu smiled at him and then turned back to the students. You will all be divided into pairs, each of which will be facing off against one of us. Your goal is simple either defeat and capture us or escape through a special gate on the opposite side of your testing ground. That caused a murmur throughout the class. Fighting robots had sounded exciting and fun, but going up against pro heroes was impossible for students not even halfway through their first year. Before the doubts crept too far, All Might held up one hand. Now, you might automatically be thinking that your only choice is to run away. Yes. Well, don't worry, we've got something to even the playing field. He lifted up a metal ring and slipped it onto his wrist. These ultra-compressed weights will make it hard for us to move and tire us out. Oh, and we held a contest to see which support course student could make the most efficient design. And young Hatsum won. Midoriya smiled at that last part. He didn't see Hatsum that often. But it was because of her that his team had done so well in the second round of the sports festival, and he considered her more than an acquaintance. Besides, if she was the reason any of them had a chance at passing this test, he was definitely going to thank her the next time he saw her. Of the other students, only Bakugo failed to show relief. What, you think we need a handicap? All Might, who had just put seven more weights on two on each wrist and two on each ankle smiled dangerously. Maybe we do. Yeah, kids. Present Mike grinned. You might have some moves, but you're going up against heroes who have seen it all. Don't expect this to be easy. Handicap or no, each of us will be giving it our all today, Aizawa said. Also, we've already organized the teams and who you'll be fighting. Here's the list. In order of first to last, each team will go one at a time and we'll only start the next test after the previous one is finished. Aizawa read out the teams. As he did so, Midoriya's sense of dread grew. Hiroshima, Minta vs. Cementos. Ida, Sato vs. Power Loader. Kaminari, Gyro vs. Present Mike. Ashido, Yeyorazu vs. Nezu. Hagakure, Anjiro vs. Snipe. Todoroki, Asui vs. 13. Yuroraka, Shoji vs. Eraserhead. Koda, Aoyama vs. Midnight. Siro, Takoyami vs. Ectoplasm. Midoriya, Bakugo vs. All Might. Of all the students in his class, Midoriya had hoped that he wouldn't be partnered up with Bakugo. He was positive that they wouldn't even be able to speak to each other civilly, much less work together to beat All Might. 
The best they could do was maybe escape, and that was only if All Might was truly slowed down. Considering he had twice the weight as the other teachers on, that was doubtful. We'll begin the test in 30 minutes, Nezu announced. You have until then to come up with a plan. In the interest of fairness, once the test begins, those who are waiting or have already finished can go to the observation room with Recovery Girl. Nezu paused. Of course, if you need her to help you after your exam, she'll come to you. Considering who they were fighting, Midoriya would be very surprised if Recovery Girl's services weren't needed. That thought quickly fled his mind when he saw Bakugo staring him down. While most of the other teams were heading to their rooms to plan though Midoriya's friends gave him looks ranging from pitying to outright concern Bakugo spun around and stomped off. Sorry, buddy, Ben said. You may have to do this one on your own. Deku, Midoriya jumped at Bakugo's shout. Move your ass. I know I'm gonna have to carry your dumb ass the whole test, but at least try to come up with a decent idea or two. Did did he just ask for help? then seemed to have the same question in mind, because he just blinked, then flickered away. Okay, so I could be wrong. Bakugo sat on one side of the table in their waiting room, and waited for Deku to stop shaking like a leaf so that he could take his own seat. For all the spine the nerd had shown during the sports festival, he still had problems looking him in the eye. Damn nerd is gonna fall apart if he can't keep it together in front of people, he thought. So, he said, using all his willpower to sound in control, what's All Might's weakness? Deku froze. W what? Did I stutter? No, wait, that's your thing. Bakugo had set aside his gauntlets, so he was able to rest his forearms on the table as he leaned forward. You know more shitty trivia on heroes than anyone alive, so do something useful with it for once. What's? All Might's. Weakness. How do I how do we beat him? Deku looked down at his hands, he finally stopped shaking, and now seemed to be giving Bakugo's question some serious thought. I don't think he has a weakness, he said. Not in the traditional sense, like an Achilles heel or anything. The safest bet would be to evade him as long as possible, and run for the exit. Bullshit. Bakugo slammed one hand on the table, making Deku jump. I'm not passing this test by running like a little bitch. He pointed at Deku. Give me a good plan, or a really good reason to run, or I'll lose on purpose. He meant it, too. Bakugo's pride had taken a serious beating over the last few months. He had consistently come in second place to Deku, of all people, had a humiliating loss in the sports festival, and then there was the embarrassment of an internship with Best Genus. This time, Bakugo would win or lose on his own terms, but because his ego had been so thoroughly bruised, it had finally opened his eyes. He needed to win. He craved victory like a starving man craves food and he had gone so long without a meaningful achievement that he was finally willing to bend, when he would have rather broken though only to a certain extent. Deku met his gaze, as if studying him, it pissed him off, but he needed Deku to know how much this meant to him. It killed him to admit, even to himself, but this was the closest he would ever come to asking for help. I might have an idea, Deku said slowly. We'd need to keep making openings for each other, and I doubt we'd be able to actually beat All Might. Bakugo almost shouted again, but then he saw something clever flash through Deku's eyes, and he held his tongue. But we can give him a good show, and make a fighting retreat to the exit. All Might didn't lose, Bakugo knew that, even if it shredded his soul to even admit it. But he could accept a fighting retreat, and as long as he got his licks in, he could even stomach working with Deku. All right, he said. What's your stupid plan? For the first time in years, Deku grinned at him in a similar way that Bakugo would grin right before a good fight. Actually, I think you'll like this one. When the 30 minutes were up, all of the students except Kirishima and Minda assembled at the observation room. Bakugo stalked off to the furthest corner he could find, and as soon as he was gone, Midoriya's friends surrounded him. Are you okay, Deku-kun? Yuraka asked. Why ya? Yeah? Midoriya said. I'm fine. You sure, Midori? Ashido briefly glared at Bakugo, who ignored her. If the jackass threatened you or something. And no, he didn't do anything like that, other than threaten to intentionally lose if he didn't at least try to beat All Might. But Midoriya didn't say that. He was actually kind of polite. For him, anyway. Todoroki frowned, and then put his right hand against Midoriya's forehead. No fever. He didn't imagine it. See so cut it out. Midoriya flailed his arms to get Todoroki to back off. All it did was get his friends to laugh. Hey, isn't the first test about to start? Yeyurazu looked at the screen, scowled, and crossed her arms. I'm conflicted. I want Kirishima to pass, but I also want Minda to suffer. Ouch. Siro winced at the dark look on her face. What did he do this time? I swear I saw him skulking around the girls' locker room, Yeyurazu said. He was gone before I could get a good look, though. Damn it, I asked Shoji to keep an eye on him today. 
he's got enough to spare. Siro rubbed the back of his head. Sorry, yeah Momo. First round, an automated voice said. Team Kirishima and Minta vs. Cementos. Begin. The two boys gave an admirable effort to capture Cementos, but their testing ground a replica of a city block was the teacher's element. It didn't take a tactician like Midoriya to see that the odds were heavily stacked against them. Kirishima hurled Minta into the air, and then held his ground to withstand a barrage of concrete battering rams. While airborne, Minta tried to rain sticky balls down on the teacher, to the point that his scalp began to bleed. Most of the balls were blocked by a giant concrete hand, and the few that actually landed did nothing to stop Cementos' quirk. Also, Minta didn't have a landing strategy, and would have been seriously injured if Cementos hadn't caught him at the last second. Kirishima ran out of steam a few minutes later, and was buried up to his neck in concrete. Team Kirishima and Minta fail. The entire match had taken less than four minutes. I suppose it is our turn, Sato-san, Ida said amidst the stunned silence. Yeah, Sato said nervously. I sure hope our plan works. While the students studied for their written exams, the teachers gathered for a review of their own. All of the students are making improvements, Cementos said, both in the classroom and with their quirks. However, there is one group in class 1 that has been making notable progress. Aizawa nodded. Midoriya and his friends. They've never had to all work together before, but they've spent enough time together in and out of class to be an effective unit but only with Midoriya among them. Whether he knows it or not, he brought them together and he inspired them. I want to remove him from the equation and see how they do. Should we break them apart entirely? Thirteen asked. Aizawa shook his head. Not all of them. For now, let's start with Ida. His speed is an asset, but it can become a liability when a teammate lacks the same mobility. I suggest we pair him with Sato, they don't know each other well, and their conflicting quirks will force them to find a balance. Ida quickly decided that Power Loader was a nightmare to fight. It was like fighting Stain again. Only instead of jumping around an alley, the teacher was digging through the ground as easily as Armadrillo. At least with Stain, he could see what was happening. But with Power Loader, the only warning of his attack was a sudden rumble underneath their feet. At first, Ida and Sato had thought things were going well, they were even in sight of the exit. However, there was a flat stretch of earth between them and their goal, and when Power Loader wasn't digging huge holes to block their path, he would pop out of the ground like a deranged jack-in-the-box to take swipes at them with his massive digging scoops. This is nuts, Sato grumbled. How can we win if we can't get past him or hit him? Ida took a deep breath. I being patient. I already learned this lesson, he thought. When Stain attacked Tensei, I was ready to charge all through Hasu to find that madman. I didn't think of the consequences, and if my friends hadn't talked me down, I would have done something reckless. I can't forget that now, not when it might help me get through this step to becoming a pro hero. Sato-san, I have an idea, Ida said quietly. It's a modification of our original plan to fight Power Loader Sensei. It will require perfect timing and a great deal of strength. Sato nodded and held up a small vial of sugar. I've got the strength part, but it'll make me stupid, remember. I do, just be ready for my signal. Sato swallowed the sugar, his muscles bulged underneath his costume, and veins popped out on his forehead. Yeah, let's go. Thinking of just attacking me. Power loader taunted from the bottom of a pit. Kind of hard if you can't even see where I am. Sato sand, now. Ida shouted. Throw me at the exit. You got it. Sato grabbed Ida by the arm, spun around twice, and hurled the other boy with all his considerable strength. So, that's your plan. Power Loader laughed. Just use your teammate as a human catapult. Too bad you're wide open while you're in the air. Power Loader rocketed up, scoops outstretched to swipe Ida out of the air. The plan was never to escape, Ida thought as he waited for his moment. It's not me who is wide open, but you. Recipro burst. Ida's boosters flared, and suddenly... He was flying straight down, even faster than Power Loader was flying up. With surprise and gravity on his side, Ida's leg slipped through Power Loader's guard and connected solidly with the teacher's metal helmet. There was an almighty clang, and Ida felt pain lance through his shin, but it was Power Loader who fell to the ground, stunned. Sato San, grab him. Sato let out a primal roar as he charged, tackling Power Loader and pulling his arms behind his back. Ida limped over and used the special handcuffs they'd been given to secure their teacher. Nice work, Power Loader said, once everything stopped ringing. You turned an obvious weakness into a devastating counterattack. It was risky, but it paid off. Thank you, Ida said as he bowed. I knew that it was unlikely for us to get past you, and while Sato-san could have hurled me with enough force to get me to the exit, I did not wish to leave my teammate behind. Good choices. Power Loader grinned. Well done. Team Ida and Sato, pass. All right. Ashido threw her arms around Ida as he rejoined them. 
You passed, Tenya. Er, thank you. As comfortable as he was with his friends, Ida was still awkward when it came to shows of physical affection, especially with someone as enthusiastic as Ishido. But I could not have succeeded without Sato-san. Yeyarazu smiled. Oh, we'll congratulate him. But I don't think he's in any condition to even understand us right now. Sato had stumbled into the observation room and sat down with a thud. His quirk, Sugar Rush, granted him enhanced strength for a limited time but at the cost of reducing his intelligence. When it wore off, he became sleepy and unresponsive. Now, as he sat in the corner, Hagakure amused herself by poking him and getting zombie-like moans in response. Ida couldn't help but chuckle at his teammate, but he winced when he put too much weight on one leg, and Yeyurazu noticed. Tenya, did you hurt yourself in your match? I do not believe it is too serious, Ida said. However, Power Loader's helmet was more durable than I expected. Deary, you should let me be the judge of whether or not an injury is serious. The students jumped when Recovery Girl appeared behind them. She ordered Ada to remove his boot and inspected the injury. Um, I think you might have a slight fracture. Hold still, and I'll fix it right up. After a quick application of Recovery Girl's quirk, Ida felt almost as tired as Sato looked, and Yeyurazu helped him find a seat. Perhaps you should ask the support department to reinforce the armor on your legs, she suggested. That might be a good idea, Ida admitted, even as his eyes drooped. A moment later, he was asleep, and he slumped over to the side. Much to Yeyurazu's embarrassment, his head landed on her shoulder, and there he stayed. Yeyurazu noticed Ashido grinning wickedly at her, and knew that it would be a long time before the other girl ever let her forget about this. Team Kaminari and Gyro, begin. Later, please, Yeyurazu mouthed and Ashido showed mercy by turning her attention to the screen. Unfortunately, the match didn't last very long. Gyro tried to hold present Mike's sonic quirk with her own, but while Gyro's quirk was powerful, it was simply outclassed. Kaminari had tried to sneak up on the teacher during the duel of sound, but had been knocked out by present Mike's stone-shattering voice before he got close enough to use his electricity. Distracted by her teammate's failure, Gyro was quickly defeated as well. Like he had during the battle trials, Midoriya provided a running commentary, taking notes on how his classmates could have done better. However, it quickly boiled down to they should have just tried to escape. For all that they claimed to be holding back, the teachers were pulling no punches. By the time Kaminari and Gyro returned, Ida had woken up from his power nap. Like his human pillow, he was incredibly embarrassed and apologized profusely, which had led to an I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, that would have gone on forever had Ishido not intervened. Hey, yeah Momo, I'd love to tease you guys, but we need to head out for our test. You're right, Mina. Yeyurazu waved at her friends who wished her luck, then patted Gyro on the shoulder. I'm sorry, Gyro-chan. Gyro, whose ears were covered in bloody bandages, narrowed her eyes. What? Yeyurazu and Ishido. Aizawa stared down at the two files on the table. The former has maintained almost perfect grades, and she's shown tremendous growth with her quirk. The latter has natural talent in practical applications, but her academic improvement has been slower than I'd like. Still, she is improving, Midnight commented. I think she's been getting tutoring from Yayorazu and Midoriya. Why do you want them together for the exam? Yayorazu is smart, but she could still freeze if her plans go off the rails. She needs to learn how to make decisions on the fly and Ashido needs to be able to rely on herself for ideas. Aizawa looked at Nezu. I trust you'll give them a chance to win. I will, Nezu promised. Still, I'm interested to see just how smart Yeyorazu is on the field. She's one of the few humans whose intelligence comes close to mine. Even Aizawa hit a shiver, it was rarely good whenever the principal decided on a battle of wits. I see we've been given a construction yard simulation, Yeyorazu observed. There will be plenty of places for Nezu-sensei to hide. How can he fight us? Ashido asked. Those weights will slow him down, and he's not that strong. Remember, he's one of the smartest people on the planet. I wouldn't be surprised if he came up with strategies for scenarios like this when he's bored. Ashido turned a slightly lighter shade of pink. Right? Team Yeyurazu and Ashido, begin. We need to lure him out, force him to make the first move. Yeyurazu led the way through the twisting piles of construction equipment. He'll probably use hit-and-run tactics, but with this terrain... There's only so much he can do. All we have to do is withstand his attacks, and... 
Um, yeah, Momo. Ashido held a hand to her ear. Do you hear something? Sure enough, there was a strange whistling sound. A moment later, there was a thunderous crash, and a freaking wrecking ball smashed through a pile of girders, missing the girls by inches. What the hell? Ashido screeched. Yeyorazu saw two girders collide with more precariously balanced equipment, which started to tip towards them. Run? She started to run directly away from the falling debris, but was surprised when Ashido charged towards it. She arced a stream of her acid up, melting a narrow groove through the metal, it fell in two piles around the girls. Holy crap, Ashido whispered, hand clutching her heart. That could have killed us. The principle isn't going easy on us, Yeyorazu said, slightly awestruck over her partner's reflexes and precision. We need to find out where he is. Or Ashido pointed at the large crane with a wrecking ball attached. I think I found him. Yeyorazu nodded, and then created a long periscope from her stomach to peer over the walls. It will take time for him to build up momentum with that crane again, so we have a chance to see oh, no. What? Nezu-sensei has positioned himself perfectly, Yeyorazu reported. From his vantage point, he can see the entire testing ground. Knowing him, he'll use that wrecking ball to knock over the terrain to block us or funnel us into a trap. So, escaping isn't gonna happen. Ashido kicked a loose stone, it skipped across the street, until it hit something metal. When she saw what it was, Ashido froze. Hey, Momo. Yes, Yeyorazu was tapping her chin and pacing, trying to think of a way to outmaneuver Nezu. What is it? He can't see through walls, can he? No. How about the sewers? Ashido pointed at the manhole not far from them. Yeyorazu looked at the manhole, then at Ashido. That's that's brilliant. Ashido saw the wrecking ball coming back and rapidly building up speed. Move first, flatter later. Rather than try to lift the heavy piece of metal, she just melted through it. Go. Both girls jumped into the simulated sewer system. Thankfully, there was no horrible smell to go along with it. Above them, the wrecking ball smashed apart another wall, which fell over the hole, blocking out the light. Well, at least he can't see us, Yeyorazu said as she created a flare and lit it. Yeah, now we just have to get to the exit from here. Ashido laughed nervously. I hope there's a manhole close to the exit. Yeyorazu created a small compass in her free hand. The exit was to our south. We just have to get close enough to make a break for it unless. Unless what? Unless we try to catch Nezu-sensei, instead of just running away. She closed her eyes and concentrated. He wasn't that far from the exit. If we can get inside his reach, we could scale the crane and capture him. You said that he could see everything around him, Ashido pointed out. Won't he see us coming after we go up? That's that's right. Yeyorazu grimaced. Either way, we'll be exposed. Ashido almost made a crass joke, but then an idea came to her. Well, he's only got two eyes, so he can't focus on more than one spot at a time. Are you suggesting we split up? Yeyorazu frowned. He'll know something is up as soon as he sees one of us alone. Not if he thinks that we're still together. Now that she had the idea, Ashido was running with it. How fast can you sprint? Come on, girls, Nezu taunted from inside his crane. You only have a few minutes left. You'll be disqualified soon. At least their idea to go into the sewers was a good one. He mused as he sipped his tea. Eiyorazu had likely calculated that he would see them anywhere on the surface, so had decided to risk a blind run through the sewers. Nezu was sure she'd use a compass to get them in the right direction, but it would still be slow going. It was too bad he'd thrown a wrench into her plan so soon. However the exam ended, he wanted to ask her what her original strategy was. Sudden movement caught his eye, and he set aside his tea. There, not too far from the exit, was Yeyorazu, with the Shido right behind her. It seemed the girls were making a desperate run for an escape. Such a shame, he said as he adjusted the wrecking ball. I expected more from you, Yeyorazu-san. Just as he sent the wrecking ball at the girls, he heard a hissing sound, and his keen nose picked up the smell of melting metal. He whirled in his seat and saw Ashido crouched behind him, one hand held a set of handcuffs, while the other dripped acid menacingly. From the hole underneath her, Nezu realized that the girl must have climbed up the crane and melted a hole into the control room. She was panting heavily, so she must have been moving for all her worth. I have no room to maneuver, Nezu said calmly and held up his paws. I surrender. Glad. Ashido took a ragged breath as she put the cuffs on him. Glad to hear it, Nezu-sensei. Team Yeyorazu and Ashido, pass. After Ashido secured the principal, she walked down to ground level with him on her shoulder. The test was over, so they could afford to be more relaxed. I must ask, Nezu said, what did you do to fool me? I could have sworn that you were with Yeyorazu-san. You'll see in a second, Ashido replied as she walked up to her teammate. 
Gaya Momo. I got him. Excellent work, Mina. Gaya Yurazu stumbled over. Can you please help me get this off? This turned out to be the source of their deception. It was a series of wires connected to a transparent plastic harness around Yeyurazu's body. On the other end of the wires was a crude mannequin of Ishido. The dummy had a purple body and legs, with pink arms and head. Its limbs were segmented to allow it to move, mimicking Yeyurazu as she dragged it behind her. Clever, Nezu said as he examined the mannequin. I couldn't see details at that distance, so I believe that you were both there. Excellent distraction. Was this your plan, Yeyurazu-san? Actually, most of this was Mina. Yeyurazu smiled at her teammate, who beamed. It might have been simple in concept, but the idea of the dummy was inspired. Tell me, what would you have done if I had figured out your ruse? We would have continued as planned, Yeyurazu admitted. If you went after Mina, I was close enough to the exit to escape, but if you managed to stop me, she could still catch you. Either way, we would have won. Nezu was pleased to see how happy the girls were, so he refrained from mentioning his last resort. He could have thrown his hot tea in Ishido's face, used the distraction to stop Yeyurazu with the wrecking ball, and then escape through a window. Yeyurazu would have been trapped, and Ishido would have been too far away to escape, not to mention blinded. But that was too cruel for a test. He would have carried out such brutal tactics against real villains, but never his students. Was he soft because he held back? Maybe, but he had made the choice to do so, and the girl's plan had been good. It was still early days, but he had a good feeling about Class 1A. Ashido laughed as Yuraraka threw her arms around her. You passed. You both passed. Of course we did, Ashido said through a face-splitting grin. We're awesome. Though she had hidden it behind her usual confidence and enthusiasm, Ashido had actually been worried sick about the exams. She knew her better academic scores were entirely thanks to the tutoring from Midoriya and Yeyurazu, and she knew she'd been way out of her depth when she saw not only who she was partnered with, but also who they were facing. She wasn't one to let doubts or insecurities get to her, but compared to them, she felt woefully inadequate. It also didn't help that a small part of her was still jealous that Yeyurazu had done so much better during the sports festival, all that had led up to her barely holding it together during the practical exam. She had fully expected Yeyurazu to have a foolproof plan in place, but that had fallen apart when Nezu had quite literally taken a wrecking ball to her strategy. So Ishido had tossed out what she considered a truly dumb idea. After all, distract and take down was such an obvious tactic that no one would fall for it, especially Nezu. Then again, the problem with geniuses was that they sometimes ignored the simplest solution to a problem. She had expected Yeyurazu to not only dismiss her idea, but come up with a dozen counterpoints to it. But instead, Yeyurazu had listened to her, trusted her, and they had ended up passing. Ashido was starting to think she might have a chance of actually being a good hero. The next round turned into an interesting game of cat and mouse. It would have been a simple matter for Hagakure to score the win for her team by sneaking past Snipe. But she and Ajiro had agreed that that was an obvious tactic that wouldn't have earned many points. Instead, Hagakure intentionally made noise around the teacher, forcing him to fire blindly and buying time for Ajiro to prepare an ambush from the rafters above him. It had been close at the end, but Ajiro managed to disarm Snipe with a swipe of his tail, and then tossed the cuffs to Hagakure, who actually caught the teacher. Their win had bolstered the hopes of the rest of the class. At that point, the number of students who passed had outpaced those who hadn't. When it was Todoroki and Asui's turn, many of their classmates were confident in their success, after all. Todoroki was one of the most powerful students in their year, and Asui was nothing if not reliable. Are we still going to try and capture 13 sensei, Ribbit? Asui asked as she and Todoroki got to the starting line. 13 always says she's not a combat-oriented hero, Todoroki said. If I can distract her, you should be able to take her down easily. If it comes down to it, I can still hold Hiro while you get to the exit. Asui nodded. Makes sense, Ribbit, but we still need to be careful of her quirk. Like most of the teachers, 13 was between them and the exit, though there was about a hundred feet separating the teacher from the student's goal. With her spacesuit concealing her features and no one was quite sure what a living black hole looked like to begin with it was impossible to tell what she was thinking. I was expecting a direct approach, Todoroki-san, 13 said calmly. How do you plan to get around my black hole? Todoroki shifted his right foot forward. I was thinking of testing how much you could take. And then allow Asui-san to attack me while I'm distracted. Yes. 13 sounded unimpressed as she popped the cap off one of her gloves. Your one-dimensional tactics only work against someone who can't counter you. 13. I want you to take down Todoroki and Asui. Aizawa studied the files in front of him. 
both sides of Todoroki's quirk negatively affect Asui, so it will force him to fight strategically, instead of unleashing huge attacks. I understand. 13 crossed her arms. I don't have to worry about collateral damage. Just don't kill the students. Do you know why I focused my skills on rescuing people? 13 called out over the howling noise of her quirk. It's because I knew that if I actually honed my combat abilities, I would become the most dangerous person on the planet. My quirk doesn't allow for anything but absolutes. Either I leave an opponent unharmed, or they die, simple as that. Todoroki created a wall of ice to try and block the unstoppable vacuum, but it was sucked up in seconds. When he tried to freeze the floor, trapping 13 in place, the teacher merely pointed her finger at the ground for a moment, sucking up the top layer of the street. His fire lasted for even less time with the oxygen snuffed out in an instant. Behind him, Asui looked on in fear. It was sobering to see someone as powerful as Todoroki so effectively shut down, and 13 hadn't even taken a single step forward. Shoto, we can't win like this. Asui called out over the noise. We need to run. If we run, she'll just catch us with her quirk. Todoroki glanced back at her and made a snap decision. I'll buy you some time, and you make a break for it. Before Asui could protest, Todoroki created a pillar of ice underneath her at an angle and launched her upward, over 13 and towards the exit. Todoroki had made his play, and now Asui's hand was forced, she had to escape, or they were certain to fail. Unfortunately, her momentum halted halfway through the air. She looked back and saw 13 aiming an uncapped finger from her other hand at her. She capped her glove as soon as Asui fell towards her, but her other remained open, eventually overwhelming Todoroki and pulling him forward as well. The students fell to their knees, and when they looked up, they saw a finger pointing at each of them. This fight is over, 13 said in no uncertain terms. If this was a real fight, if I was a real villain, you would be dead. For the purposes of this exam, you have failed to capture me, and you failed to get away. Her voice became a little kinder. I'm sorry, but you will not pass today. Team Todoroki and Nasui fail. Midoriya was more than a little shocked, not just because Todoroki and Nasui had failed, but by how powerful 13 could be when she stopped holding back. If she had chosen a different path in life, she would have been a terrifying villain. It also hit him that two of his friends would now not be going to the summer camp. Hiroaka was the first to reach the dejected pair as they rejoined them. Shoto, Tsu, I'm sorry, Todoroki said, focusing on Asui. I was overconfident because 13 focuses on rescue, not combat. This is all my fault. Asui shook her head. No, it's my fault too. I should have insisted on escaping instead of fighting, Ribbit. She looked genuinely upset as she turned to the others. I'm sorry, Ribbit. I guess we're not going with you. Iroraka gave Asui a hug, but then saw Shoji waving her over. She reluctantly parted from her friends, but accepted an encouraging nod from Midoriya. It just goes to show you just how serious the teachers are about this test. Siro commented as he put a hand on Todoroki's shoulder and an arm around Asui. We won't fail again, Todoroki promised. Next time, we'll pass. Asui blinked back tears as she nodded, then leaned into Siro's side with a ribbit. Ashido would have teased her, but Asui looked too miserable, and Ashido herself was also too upset that some of their group wouldn't be able to enjoy the summer camp. It was a sobering realization that they all had a long way to go. Iroraka tried to stay focused, but it was hard when all she could think about was the crestfallen look on her friends' faces. It bothered her so much that not all of them would be able to enjoy something they had worked so hard to reach. Iroraka san are we still going to run for the exit? Shoji asked with one of his tentacle mouths. It seems like everyone's initial plans keep failing. I think it's still a good idea, Iroraka said. Aizawa sensei can shut down our quirks, and he's way better at fighting than we are. But we still have the backup plan. Right? Shoji swiveled an extra eye around as they walked through their test site, which was designed to look like a typical suburban neighborhood. Still no sign of him, but we'll know he's there as soon as his extra eye abruptly reverted to its original tentacle-like form. There. No more time, go for plan A. Yuroraka jumped into Shoji's arms, and then everything went dark as his membranes encircled her like a blanket. Run, Shoji-san. Both Yuroraka and Shoji rely on their quirks, either for mobility or surveillance, Aizawa said. I'll shut down their quirks and force them to think of another plan. It's amazing how often a student loses their confidence after you erase their quirk, All Might commented. What lesson are you trying to teach them here? Aizawa smirked. To not rely on fancy powers, but their own skills. Yuraka had known going in that fighting Aizawa would be a challenge. All he had to do was look at them, and their quirks would be impossible to use. However, that was the trick Aizawa had to see them. She had remembered, during a ramble from Midoriya in a study session, 
That Aizawa couldn't erase a quirk if there was something blocking the target, though he only had to see a small part of their bodies to do so. That was why Shoji had completely encased her in his arms. As long as Aizawa couldn't see her directly, her quirk was still usable. How much further? She called out, her voice muffled. I can see the exit, Shoji reported, but I still can't use my quirk. Aizawa sensei must still be close. I am, Aizawa said, suddenly behind them. His capture tool lashed out and wrapped around Shoji's leg. And now, I have you. Plan B, Uraraka shouted, and pressed her fingers against Shoji's chest. Now weightless, Shoji pushed off the ground and kicked off the now slack scarf. The weightlessness only lasted for a second, and then Uraraka released it. Shoji landed heavily, but grabbed the capture tool before Aizawa could reel it back in. His quirk might have still been erased, but his strength was completely natural. Aizawa had no chance in a game of tug-of-war. Uraraka leaped out of Shoji's arms and made a dash for Aizawa's legs. She slid underneath them, but now that she was out of his line of sight, she was free to use her quirk and reached for his back. Aizawa had clearly expected that sort of move, and unleashed a devastating reverse kick without even looking. His foot connected with her head, but her new helmet kept her from getting anything worse than a bruise. Good teamwork, Aizawa grunted, but you don't have the skill to beat me in a straight fight. Uraraka almost snapped back, but she remembered a lesson from Gunhead. Don't engage in needless conversation in the middle of a fight, to save her breath for actually beating the enemy. As she rolled out of the way of another kick, Uraraka noticed something in a side street. It had been an idea she and Shoji had toyed with, but they hadn't been aware of their terrain before the test started, and they'd had no way to know if it would come up. Still, now that it was a possibility, Shoji-san, she barked. Plan C. Aizawa raised an eyebrow as Uraraka jumped out of reach and circled around to Shoji. Plan C. C for cover, Shoji said, and spread out his arms as widely as possible blocking Aizawa's line of sight to his teammate as she ran behind him. Duck, Uraraka shouted, and Shoji dropped. A moment later, Aizawa saw the manhole cover Uraraka had made weightless and hurled like a discus at him. As soon as his gaze landed on Uraraka, her quirk was erased, which meant that gravity suddenly applied to the circle of metal again. Gravity didn't mean momentum was gone, though, if anything. Though the manhole cover started to arc down, the effect of gravity made it speed up. With the weights on his arms and legs, and his capture tool still held by Shoji, Aizawa couldn't avoid the hunk of metal that collided with his stomach. It wasn't the worst hit he'd ever taken that dubious honor went to the Namu from USJ but the wind was certainly knocked out of him, and he'd have to let Recovery Girl make sure he didn't have any internal injuries. Shoji-san, get him. Winded though he was, Aizawa wasn't completely helpless, and he tossed out a handful of caltrops in an effort to stave off Shoji. The boy just powered through them and wrapped his powerful arms around Aizawa, pinning his own arms to his sides. A moment later, Uraraka slapped the cuffs on him. Team Uraraka and Shoji, pass. Most of Class 1A had been stunned by Todoroki and Asui's loss, but their flagging hopes were restored by the victory over Aizawa. Most of them had subconsciously assumed that they would be unable to win after their quirks were erased, and would have to run away. Perhaps for the first time, some of them wondered if quirks were what was required to be a hero. Achako, that was amazing. For Midoriya, all he cared about was that his girlfriend had passed the exam, and he showed his enthusiasm by hugging her and spinning her around in his arms. She laughed tiredly and hugged him back. Thanks, Deku-kun, she said. But I couldn't have done any of that without Shoji-san. All right, Midoriya put her down and turned to Shoji, who was getting his minor cuts and bruises treated by Recovery Girl. You are both great out there, Shoji-san. Thank you, Shoji said with a nod. But if you don't mind, I will refrain from getting hugged. Most of the students, even those who had failed the exam, chuckled a little at Midoriya and Uraraka's embarrassed reactions. They hadn't exactly hid that they were dating, though they kept public displays of affection to a minimum. Still, this was high school, so their personal lives were generally known by their classmates, whether they wanted it or not. All right, you kids, recovery girl called out, I think it's time for the next test. Midoriya swallowed nervously and shared a tense look with Bakugo, only two more teams, and then it would be their turn. Koda and Aoyama surprised everyone with a quick and almost easy victory over Midnight. Koda had stolen the show by finally revealing the full power of his quirk, Anna Voice. He summoned a huge flock of birds to swarm the teacher, keeping her occupied until Aoyama could line up the perfect shot with his naval laser. She'd been stunned, but neither boy wanted to risk getting close to her, so Koda had more birds place the cuffs on her for him. That was also the day that the class discovered that Koda had an adorably high-pitched voice. For many of them, it was worth the months wondering what he sounded like. Siro and Takoyami's test was more worrying, 
They were up against ectoplasm, and their testing zone was built to resemble a shopping mall. The hallways limited Ciro's movement and gave the advantage to ectoplasm, who could create dozens of duplicates of himself. Ciro didn't need to have Midoriya's talent in tactics or quirk analysis to know that this would be hard for him. Thankfully, Takoyami had had an idea. All they needed to do was get enough room to make it work. Ciro isn't a fighter, Aizawa said bluntly. His quirk isn't suited to a battle of strength, but it seems he knows this. He does like to go on about how he loves anything involving maneuverability, All Might added. He had been quiet for most of the meeting, but this analysis of the students had started to become kind of fun, especially if this ended up helping them. He could see why Midoriya enjoyed it so much. Exactly, Aizawa said, though it sounded like it cost a piece of his soul to agree with the other man. His quirk also dehydrates him after extended use, which means he has to balance just how much tape he can make. Ectoplasm, I want you to overwhelm him, force him to really think about his moves. Ectoplasm nodded. What about Takoyami? You'll be fighting in the light, and dark shadow can only do so much without darkness. Aizawa adjusted his scarf. In this situation, both of them will have to use their quirks sparingly, at least until they either escape, or if they find a way to outmaneuver you. I'll give them a chance, but don't think I'll go easy on you. Ectoplasm opened his mouth, and silvery blobs poured out, they quickly formed into perfect copies of himself, and they fanned out to hunt down the students. It didn't take them long, but the first clone to attack was slammed to the ground by Dark Shadow, and quickly melted into a puddle. Ectoplasm's quirk was odd not necessarily in what it did, but how he could control his clones. They followed his thoughts, while many other clone-based quirks either created independent copies or solid illusions. The downside was that he felt an echo of the pain his clones did, and he could get overwhelmed by too much mental stimuli. But decades of training had largely mitigated those weaknesses. His quirk was also what made him such a good teacher. He could observe each student in a classroom individually and give each one the same amount of attention. In this case, observing Siro and Takoyami from several different perspectives showed him one very important thing. They were better than they gave themselves credit for. Takoyami's file suggested that he had struggled with the violent nature of his quirk for most of his life. He was always fighting to keep Dark Shadow from going on a rampage, especially in the dark. However, as he watched the living quirk methodically decimate his clones, Ectoplasm saw just how much control Takoyami had. So long as he wasn't fighting someone with a hard counter to Dark Shadow, Takoyami was almost unstoppable. Siro, on the other hand, had a low opinion of himself when it came to combat. Yes, maneuverability and capture were his strong points, but he wasn't as useless as he claimed to be. His technique needed polishing, but he took advantages of any openings Dark Shadow created by delivering quick punches and kicks to weaken clones, and set up devastating combos by taping up others. Both boys had a good eye for necessary spacing, and made sure to keep enough distance to not get in each other's way, but close enough to support the other if they had to. It was all rudimentary teamwork, nothing fancy, but Ectoplasm saw how quickly they fell into that pattern and approved. Plenty of heroes had to work with others they were unfamiliar with, and such tactics were a tried and true method for success. The students fought their way through a dozen clones until they found the real Ectoplasm, standing guard in front of the exit. Even if they just wanted to escape, they would still have to deal with him. Ectoplasm could have just swarmed them with clones. After all, he could replace any he lost indefinitely, while Ciro would eventually get dehydrated. And once one student was incapacitated, it would be easy to defeat the other. However, he wanted to see how they would react if they had to fight a real monster. Hello, students, he said in his deepest voice, a trait he'd used to intimidate criminals before. You got through my clones easily enough. Well done. Thanks, Ectoplasm Sensei, Siro said, while Takoyami only nodded his head in acknowledgement. Unfortunately, I have more than just numbers on my side. Ectoplasm took a deep breath and then vomited forth a much larger blob that formed a giant version of himself. I cannot create other clones while using this giant, but it is more than a match for you. Ciro's helmet and Takoyami's avian features meant that Ectoplasm couldn't get a good read on them through facial expressions, but their body language told him a great deal. They were certainly surprised not that he blamed them, since he hardly ever used his giant clone, so they were unlikely to know about it but instead of panicking, they were determined. That was good. Heroes couldn't afford to let surprises shock them into inaction. Siro san go. Takoyami sent out Dark Shadow, who latched onto the giant's face. Ectoplasm watched as Siro swung through the area on his tape. At first, he thought the boy would try to escape, but the giant would hit him no matter what direction he took. Then he saw Siro tape up the skylight above them, 
before kicking out every light he could reach. In less than a minute, the room barely had any light. You're good, Takoyami-san. Siro called out. Let him have it. Now, dark shadow. It could have been ectoplasm's imagination. But he thought Takoyami's eyes glowed as balefully as his quirks. Unleash your fury. About time. With so little light, dark shadow grew to monstrous proportions. He still wasn't as big as the giant clone. But his strength was more than enough to smash it into the far wall. It's been forever since I could cut loose. While the two monsters battled, Ectoplasm tried to keep an eye out for Ciro. In the darkness, that was difficult, and the first sign he had of the student's attack was a strand of tape that wrapped around one of his prosthetic legs. He was pulled off balance and then encased in tape up to his neck. Takoyami-san, I got him. Ciro shouted. Tell Dark Shadow to lay off. I cannot. Takoyami yelled back. He becomes wild in the darkness. Crap. Ciro muttered, then looked down at the teacher. Sorry, Ectoplasm Sensei, I'll be right back. Ectoplasm knew from Takoyami's file just how dangerous Dark Shadow could be. The test is over, just go. Ciro zipped back up to the ceiling and tore away the tape on the skylight. Once a few beams of light came through, they forced Dark Shadow into a smaller, more controllable state. He was still brimming with energy, but was no longer on the rampage. Team Siro and Takoyami, pass. My apologies, Takoyami said with a short bow. I did not expect Dark Shadow to become quite that bad. He is usually only like that at night. Not my fault you never let me go all out, Dark Shadow muttered petulantly. Ectoplasm allowed Siro to help free him from the tape. You both did well, Siro-san. You were key to helping Takoyami-san become as powerful as he did. However, Takoyami-san, you should remember to communicate such dangers, even if they may not occur. Such things may be crucial for a teammate to know. Had Siro-san not acted as quickly as he had, I would have been forced to step in, and you both might have failed. Both boys bowed. Yes, Sensei. Ectoplasm smiled. Now, you two should go back to the observation room. I am sure neither of you want to miss the next match. Siro grinned as his friends surrounded him. So much time had been spent doubting his abilities in a fight. And he had not only managed to defeat a pro hero with help, and said hero was handicapped but he had also gone above and beyond by making sure Dark Shadow didn't go out of control. He was feeling pretty good about himself, though it was soured a little by knowing that Todoroki and Asui wouldn't be going with him to camp. Great job, Ribbit, Asui croaked, doing her best to stay happy for him. I had no idea Ectoplasm Sensei could make a giant clone. Most of the rising stars paused. They expected Midoriya to shower them with little known trivia about Ectoplasm. But to their surprise, he was silent. Then they saw that he was locking eyes with Bakugo. Come on, nerd, Bakugo snarled. I'm not gonna get disqualified because you were too busy playing with your friends. Ashido muttered something under her breath as Bakugo stormed off. Siro didn't catch it, but Yeyorazu did. And it wasn't nice if her mortified expression was anything to go by. Good luck, Deku-kun, Yuraraka said nervously, and gave him a quick hug, which he returned. Thanks, he said, and took a deep breath. We're both going to need it. Yeah, but the only reason we'd root for Bakugo is because we want you to pass, Siro thought. The students watched the screen with rapt attention, as Bakugo and Midoriya arrived at their testing grounds. It had been designed to look like a typical small city, with dozens of houses that eventually became a business district. There was plenty of room to maneuver, but also plenty of opportunities to cause collateral damage. That would lower their score, and both of them would have to be careful. Kaminari coughed into his hand to break the tension. So, any bets on how long those two last against All Might? I say five minutes, unless Bakugo goes nuts and tries to blow up Midoriya. Six minutes, and I say Bakugo gets knocked out first. Hagakure chimed in. Two minutes, Ajiro said. I mean, it's All Might they're fighting. Even if he has to hold back, he could probably take down any of Midoriya's forms in one punch, right? Midoriya's friends felt a little indignant on his behalf, though they had to admit that the idea of All Might losing was a bit hard to believe. Ten minutes, Todoroki declared, and Midoriya gets in at least two good hits. Same time. But I bet Midoriya has to save Bakugo once, Asui said. Most of the other rising stars made similar bets, but Yuraraka crossed her arms, never taking her focus away from the screen. I bet they'll pass. The rest of the class, and even Recovery Girl, regarded her with some disbelief, but none of them argued with her. There was a deep conviction in her eyes, an absolute faith that Midoriya would win a faith that somehow even reached out to Bakugo. Team Midoriya and Bakugo, begin. 
and Ko hummed to herself as she gathered the ingredients for dinner. It was a little early, but she got off work early that day and had nothing else to distract her. Izuku had told her that today was the practical exam for midterms, and he was nervous about it. And Ko was optimistic about her son's chances after all. He was a good student, and he was getting the hang of his alien's powers. Then again, he still sometimes lets his nerves get the better of him, Inko said to herself. Oh, I hope his friends keep him from going down that path before it's too late. But what if they suddenly decide to sabotage him to boost their own scores? What if, for several minutes, Inko spiraled deeper into her own fears for her son, until she reached one fact that she couldn't deny? No matter what happens, Ben will be there for him, she said. And he's brought out the best in Izuku. I'm sure they'll both be fine. Satisfied, Inko was about to get back to making dinner when her phone rang. It was across the room, and rather than put down the measuring cup she was using, she simply summoned the phone to her hand with her quirk. Distracted as she was, she didn't see the caller ID when she answered. Hello, hello, Inko. The voice of Midoriya Hisashi nearly made her drop the phone. It had been almost two weeks since she'd heard from her husband. Absence made the heart grow fonder, it was said, and Inko felt butterflies in her stomach at the sound of his voice, just like every time. Hisashi, Inko put away everything else and focused entirely on the phone. I wasn't expecting your call until next week. Is everything all right? Hisashi laughed. Everything is fine. Inko better than fine? Actually, really, that's good. Inko glanced at the time. Izuku isn't home right now, though. He's taking his midterm practical exam today. I can call again later today, but I wanted to talk to you first. Inko was surprised. Hisashi loved his family and called as often as work allowed, but she couldn't remember the last time he called more than once in a day. Well, I'm here. She could almost hear his loving smile as he spoke. How would you like to go on a little vacation? This better fucking work, Deku. Midoriya glanced uneasily at his partner, then went back to cycling through his aliens. If it doesn't, you'll have every right to be mad at me. I'm always mad at you, moron. B but then you'll have a G good reason. Bakugo scoffed, then glanced at the Ultimatrix. Just pick one already, damn it. Midoriya flinched, and then turned into shock squatch. Okay, we should still hurry for the exit, eh? It'll make things easier if we have to go with plan B. Back Hugo grumbled wordlessly, and then stomped off, he didn't get far before a living meteor crashed down from the sky, breaking apart the street and nearly knocking both students over. Who cares if I destroy this place? All Might cried, falling into the role of the villain. The real question is, can you two weaklings stop me? For the first time since the exam began, Buck Hugo's signature wild grin appeared. Tiny explosions erupted from his hands. I guess we'll find out, huh? Back in the observation room, even Uraraka looked nervous, despite her earlier conviction. Um, recovery girl. The nurse glanced at her. Yes, dearie. All Might Sensei knows not to hurt them, right? Recovery girl sighed. Intellectually, yes, but if he gets too excited, he may overdo it. Which means I may have my work cut out for me by the time this is done. More than one student winced, you would have to be living under a rock to not have ever seen a video of All Might pummeling a villain, and they were always hauled away by an ambulance. Asui patted Uraraka's shoulder. They'll be fine, Ribbit, we were all joking with those bets, right, everyone? The other students hastily agreed with her, though most privately thought that even giving Bakugo and Midoriya five minutes was generous. This was, after all, the man who could change the weather by moving too fast on a Sunday stroll. Uraraka clasped her hands together as she watched her boyfriend get ready for his fight. Please be careful, Deku-kun. Your job is simple, All Might, Aizawa told him. You need to show Bakugo and Midoriya the gap between good students and the very best of the best. Bakugo still has that pride of his, and Midoriya hasn't really lost yet. Both of them need to have some humility beaten into them. I understand, All Might said. I still need to give them a chance, right? A chance to escape, Aizawa amended. Don't let them win in a straight fight. If they can't figure out that there are some opponents they can't beat, then they'll have to rethink their choice of careers. All Might couldn't blame him. After all, if he had faced all for one with backup, he might not have been crippled. Far better for the boys to learn that lesson in a safe environment and still have lives to look forward to. Surprising exactly no one, Bakugo made the first move, blasting forward with one hand and aiming the other at All Might. Die. The explosion that ripped through the street was powerful enough to shatter more than a few windows. Had All Might been anyone else, that one attack would have certainly left them reeling, and probably in need of a doctor. However, when the smoke cleared, All Might was completely unhurt. In fact, he just threw his head back and laughed. Ha ha ha. All Might put his hands on his hips. If that's the best you've got, young Bakugo, I'm afraid you have a long way to GRK. 
Shocksquatch had taken the opportunity to fire a bolt of lightning from his mouth, which struck All Might square on. Like Bakugo's explosion, it didn't hurt the man, but the electricity did cause his muscles to lock up for a second. That second was all Bakugo needed to get in close and unleash a barrage of smaller explosions. Just fall down, damn it. All Might did take a single step back, but only so that he could deliver a stinging backhand to Bakugo's face that sent him hurtling into a parked car. If you're trying to wear me down with little attacks like that, I'm afraid you picked the wrong opponent. All Might turned when he saw a flash of green light. Don't think I forgot about you, young Midoriya. Wrath didn't think you did. Wrath's fist was headed for All Might's face, but the symbol of peace caught it in one muscular hand. No fair. Wrath is the strong one. Are you sure about that? All Might cocked back his free hand. Texas smash. It was hard to tell what actually sent Wrath flying clear through a house, the punch that hit him in the gut, or the tornado said punch produced. All Might laughed again and was about to follow after him, only for Bakugo to leap onto his back and put both hands on his head. The following point-blank explosion sent Bakugo flying back and for All Might to stagger forward. He had taken much worse in his career, but that was certainly unpleasant, and he was distracted enough to not be ready for Wrath to come barreling out of the dust and clock him across the jaw. Now, Deku. Bakugo shouted as he bombarded All Might again. Don't tell Wrath what to do. Wrath shouted back, even as he jumped away and slapped the dial on his belt. Ghost Freak. All Might knew what the boys were planning. The problem was, he had no idea how to counter a body snatcher who could become immune to physical attacks. All he could do was brace himself as Ghost Freak flew straight into him, and everything went dark. I guess it's over, Ciro commented. We all forgot he could do that. All Izuku has to do is keep All Might in place, and Bakugo can put the cuffs on him. I'm not sure, Ribbit. Asui pointed. What's going on down there? Everything was dark. Midoriya could barely see as he trudged through the snow. The only thing that illuminated the darkness was a distant fire. How did I get here? He asked himself. I was Ghost Freak, and I was fighting All Might, and now I'm in this place. What's going on? It took what felt like ages, but he found his way to the fire. It could have been his imagination, but he thought it was shrinking, ever so slowly. You are not supposed to be here. Seven voices all spoke as one and they chilled Midoriya more than the snow ever could. Seven shadowy figures appeared all around him, and all pointed at him. You are no successor, they said. You have no power here. Leave. You will not control him. We will always fight you. Midoriya felt a sharp pain in his chest, as if he'd been punched, and then a tugging sensation. And Ghost Freak tumbled out of All Might with a gasp. What? How did? Deku, get your head in the fucking game. Bakugo growled like a rabid animal as he blasted at All Might again. Plan A didn't fucking work. All right, try for plan B. Ghost Freak slapped the dial on his chest and vanished in a flash of green light. Echo Echo. This new form was far from intimidating. In fact, it was almost cute. It looked like a small child in a white onesie, only its head was too large, and it had a glowing green mouth and eyes. It also had what looked like headphones as part of its body and the Ultimatrix dial on its chest. All Might gave his signature booming laugh. He seemed genuinely amused by Midoriya's choice of transformation but nobody fooled themselves into thinking he was overconfident. In this day and age, anyone could be hiding a deadly power behind a cute facade. Hey, All Might. Bakugo landed next to Echo Echo and pointed one gauntlet at the hero. His other hand reached for the pin on that gauntlet. I never got a chance to show this off before. These gauntlets aren't for show, they store up my sweat for really powerful explosions, and they just got topped off. He pulled the pin, and the hole on the front of the gauntlet glowed like the sun. Die. The explosion that followed rocked the entire street. Even the students watching the fight felt a slight rumble as the shockwave hit them. When the smoke faded, All Might was still standing, but he'd been pushed back a good ten feet, and he looked a little scorched. Okay, that was impressive, young Bakugo. All Might admitted behind the arms that crossed protectively over his face. It's a good thing no one actually lives here or there'd be an uptick in tinnitus cases. Big deal, Bakugo scoffed. I've had tinnitus for years. Echo Echo took his chance. All Might had blocked his line of sight, but it would only last a moment. As he ran forward, copies of him split off, until eight of him jumped onto All Might, grabbing onto his arms and legs. Sorry, about this, All Might. One Echo Echo said in a robotic voice, and then all of them took a deep breath. The sonic scream that came out was devastating at point-blank range. Any windows still intact after Bakugo's attack couldn't withstand the sound, and even All Might let out a brief yell of pain. Gyro might have still been deaf, but she could figure out what Midoriya was doing, and she threw up her hands. Okay, I give up. We should just assume he can do everything we can. 
Nobody noticed how Midoriya's friends all shared a quick smile. Gyro was more correct than she realized. All Might clenched his jaw and powered through the pain. If Midoriya had thought his attack would defeat him, he was sorely mistaken, and he had just placed himself in a bad position. Oklahoma Smash All Might twisted around at incredible speeds, briefly creating a tornado around himself that sent Echo Echo, and his copies flying through the air. Bekugo tried to rush in with another point-blank explosion, but All Might was quite finished with those. A swift uppercut sent the boy tumbling end over end. Midoriya was in the middle of transforming again. But with the green light all around, All Might couldn't tell what he was turning into. As he drew back his fist, he hoped it was something durable. There was a sickening crunch. Iroraka muffled a scream when she saw All Might's arm impale her boyfriend through the chest. I am so glad I turned into this one, Swampfire said as he looked down. That kind of injury would have killed him as all but a few of his aliens. So am I, young Midoriya, All Might admitted. I'm going to pull my arm free now, that smell is awful. Actually, it's not just a bad smell. Swampfire wrapped one arm around All Might's, while green gas poured from his body. It's methane. All Might had exactly one second to realize what that meant, and then Swampfire snapped his fingers, creating a single spark. For a moment, the students could only gape as Swampfire blew himself up in a massive explosion. I'm going to kill him, Yuraraka growled. Who? Ashido asked as they watched Swampfire regenerate from scraps. All Might or Midori? Yes. Deku, this isn't working. Bakugo spat as he limped over to Swampfire. He just tanks everything we throw at him. I know, Swampfire said as they warily backed down another street. I think it's time for the backup plan. Shit, I didn't want to use that one. Bakugo looked at his hands, one gauntlet was cracked, and he didn't want to risk using a super blast with that hand. We'll get one chance, close your eyes when I reach back. Got it. You boys are persistent, All Might said as he stalked towards them. His costume had a few tears, but the only sign of injury was a trickle of blood in the corner of his mouth. But I think I'm done playing around. It's a good thing Recovery Girl is here. All Might moved, one second, he was half a block away, and the next, he was right in front of Swampfire. A palm strike sent him flying into an overturned car with such speed that the vehicle resembled a rough U-shape. And now for you, young All Might grimaced when he saw the glowing hand in his face. Oh, not again. Stun grenade. There was no damage from this move, but Hugo had created it to generate as much light as possible in one big flash. All Might covered his eyes with one hand, even as he used the other to create a gust of wind that sent Bak Hugo flying through the window of an office building. Blinded as he was, All Might didn't see the other flash of light. As his vision returned, however, he did see the enormous foot as it connected with him. In the observation room, most of the class was completely awestruck. Only Uraraka had gotten a good look at Way Big. Everyone else in their part of the entrance exam had been too busy running from the giant robot. Holy, Ciro began. Crap, Ashido finished. Ribbit, Asui added. That won't stop him for long, Way Big said as he watched All Might rocket into the distance. We've got one shot at passing now. Back Hugo staggered out of the half-demolished building. Yeah, yeah, just get it over with, Deku. Wei Big couldn't deny that a small part of him enjoyed picking up Bakugo and hurling him at the exit like he was a baseball. That enjoyment ended when he heard a sonic boom behind him. He had about two seconds to process what was happening. First, All Might was returning from wherever Wei Big had kicked him to. Second, he was flying very, very fast. Third, he wasn't aiming at Wei Big, but Bakugo, he was trying to intercept him. Way Big moved without thinking. He couldn't afford to fail this test, so he placed himself between All Might and Bak Hugo, who was already using explosions to slow his speed and land safely. Way Big tried to block All Might with his arms, but the symbol of peace moved too fast and slipped through his guard. Detroit. This is going to hurt, Way Big thought. Smash. Incredible force was delivered to Way Big's jaw. He felt the beginnings of pain, and then everything went black. All Might knew he'd messed up, even before throwing that last punch. The weights he wore might have slowed him down, but he could overcome them with enough effort, and that was what happened. Without consciously thinking about it, he had stopped holding back, at least a little. It was his own fault, and he knew it. Despite everything he'd told himself, that Midoriya was nothing like all for one. He'd somehow confused the two in his mind. It had started after the boy had tried to possess him as Ghost Freak. After that, the remnants of one for all which had been reduced to mere whispers after passing it on to Mirio, had suddenly screamed at him to destroy this threat. He had done his best to tune the voices out, but after getting kicked halfway across the testing grounds by Way Big, his concentration had fallen apart, and he had unleashed hell. Time seemed to move in slow motion. All Might watched, helpless, as Way Big spun around in mid-air twice, 
and then transformed back to normal an instant before he crashed into the street. Even before All Might landed on the ground, he could see the blood pooling around the boy's head. Then time resumed its normal pace, and All Might moved in a blur, scooping up the boy and rushing him to recovery girl's office. He heard the automated voice announce the student's victory, and while he knew he'd feel proud for them later, he was much more concerned with the here and now. Recovery girl and Nezu were going to give him hell for this, he just knew it. Recovery girl was heading for the door, but she noticed that seven students had already beaten her to it. She was touched by the care they have for their friend, and she would tell them as much after walloping All Might with her cane. That is, as much as Yuraraka wanted to be in the nurse's office to check on Midoriya. Recovery girl had firmly told them all to wait outside until she had finished working on the boy. Only All Might was allowed to come in, but only because Recovery Girl was absolutely livid, and was explaining to a man who could kill her with his pinky finger exactly why. Yuraraka respected All Might as much as anyone, but she took a sick delight in listening to him getting chewed out. A broken jaw, fractured skull, moderate concussion, strained tendons across his entire body you've hit villains with less, you numb skull. Though hearing how badly her boyfriend was hurt did little to settle Yuraraka's nerves. I understand, but oh. Obviously, I went a little overboard ouch. I'm not finished, you big lummox. I'm still not sure how his quirk affects his body, but those rapid fire transformations exhausted him. I can't even heal him completely, because he doesn't have the energy for it. I could barely stabilize him, and now I have to wait for him to wake up and use swamp fire to do the rest of the work. And that smell is going to last for days. And I will buy you as many air fresheners as you want, All Might promised. Just please stop hitting me. One more, and then I'm done. There was a loud thwack, which had the rising stars collectively wince. Okay, now you can go. And tell the kids outside that they can come in, as long as they're quiet. Yuraraka leaned away from the door as it opened, and a sheepish All Might stepped into the hallway. Yuraraka wasn't sure just what look she was giving him but it made him take a step back with his hands raised in surrender. Young Midoriya will be okay, he said, trying to sound reassuring. All he has to do is, with all due respect, sensei, but we heard, Yeyorazu cut in. May we go in to see him now? All Might stepped aside to let the students hurry in, and then swiftly left. To anyone else, it appeared that he moved so fast because he feared Recovery Girl's wrath, and while that was true, he was also running out of the time he could spend in his muscle form that day. Running from Recovery Girl was just a convenient excuse or maybe his time limit was an excuse to get away from Recovery Girl. Not even he knew. In the infirmary, the conscious students all winced when they saw Midoriya's condition. He looked terrible. He was covered in bruises and scrapes, while the left half of his face was horribly swollen. He hardly looked like he'd just passed the exam, then again. Midori got knocked out before the test ended, Ashido said worriedly. Does that mean that he failed? I suppose that it is up to the teachers, Ida offered. We all saw the fight itself, and the teamwork Izuku and Bakugo showed was impressive. It's possible that Izuku earned enough points to pass, and Bakugo only reached the exit because Izuku threw him there, Todoroki pointed out. That has to count for something. Speaking of which, where is that jerk? Ashido asked. He got smacked around by All Might pretty bad. He's resting in the other infirmary, recovery girl said. I had to focus on Midoriya, and Bakugo's injuries weren't as bad as they appeared. Aside from a dislocated arm, which I already healed, he just needs to rest for a few days. Ugh. Everyone turned back to Midoriya as he stirred and slowly sat up. Oh, Izuku. Yuraka hugged him tightly. I saw your fight, and if you ever scare me like that again, I'll I'll. Kiss him silly, ribbit. Asui somehow managed to look teasing without changing her expression at all. Midoriya was too out of it to be embarrassed, he started to lean onto Yuraraka's shoulder, but he did so with the injured half of his face. He jolted back, hand going to the bandages. Try not to do that, recovery girl scolded. If you've got the energy, turn into swamp fire and save yourself some exhaustion from my quirk. Okay, Midoriya muttered, mouth hurting too much to say more. He activated the ultimatrix, and everyone stepped back to avoid the inevitable stink. It took almost a full minute of regenerating for Midoriya to heal. But when he turned back to normal, everyone was relieved to see him recovered. Yuraraka in particular was happy she could hug him without causing pain. So did we pass? Midoriya asked. Your team did, recovery girl said. However, since you were knocked out before the end, it's possible you may not have. You'll find out before your excuse for the day. She turned to the other students. Now, does anyone else need my help? If not, you should all clear out, since class 1B will be starting their exam soon, and I'm sure they'll need me before too long. As the rising stars headed back to the locker rooms to change out of their costumes, Asui and Todoroki looked more and more upset. 
Midoriya couldn't blame them. They'd all been looking forward to going to the summer camp together. It didn't help his nerves to think that he might not be going, either. The first thing that happened was that the written exams were handed back, graded and with feedback. To everyone's relief, the entire class had at least passed the written portion. Midoriya was more than happy with his 91% score, but Ashido had been absolutely ecstatic. Not only had she passed, she had gotten more than the bare minimum required. All right, Aizawa said as the students gathered around, after comparing scores. Obviously, some of you failed the practical exam. You'll get notes on what you should have done differently, but the fact remains that you failed. Midoriya, the boy in question jumped a little when Aizawa's gaze landed on him. You were defeated by your opponent, but your actions caused your partner to escape and pass. That netted you just enough points to pass as well, but you'll have to work hard to prove you won't make the same mistakes twice. Midoriya nodded automatically, and it took him a moment to realize that he had passed the test. He almost beamed, until he remembered that nearly a third of his class including two of his friends weren't so lucky. He settled for accepting Yuraraka's hand when she slipped it into his. Now, for those of you who failed Aizawa swept his gaze over the six students in question. You're still going to the summer camp. There was a long pause, and then the entire class, even Todoroki and Bakugo, reacted as one. What? Aizawa gave them his familiar sadistic grin. You should have expected that by now. It was another logical deception. One meant to bring out your best. Even though you failed, you'll still be coming along. His smile grew wider, and a little scarier. But you'll be taking extra lessons to catch up with the rest of your class. It will push your bodies and minds to the breaking point, and beyond in short, it'll be hell on earth. Some of the students who failed hesitated, but only for a moment. This was their chance to not only go to the summer camp, but also redeem themselves, in their eyes, if no one else's. All right, you can all go home, Aizawa said. Get some rest, because you'll need it for what's coming. As soon as the teachers walked off, Ashido tackled Todoroki in a hug. You're going to camp with us. She snagged Asui into the hug a moment later. We're all going together. I can't believe we fell for another of Aizawa sensei's deceptions, Yeyurazu said, though she was unable to keep the smile off her face. You'd think we'd learn by now. The rest of their friends joined in on the group hug. This is going to be so awesome, Siro shouted. Even if it's going to be a lot of work, at least you two can still have fun. Todoroki and the Sui shared a determined nod. We'll work hard, and we won't fail again, Todoroki promised. Todoroki's stoic image was a little ruined by Ashido hugging him and squishing her cheek against his, but the point stood. After a few minutes of celebrating, everyone was just about done with class for the day. Midoriya was about to go with his friends to visit Iri before heading home, but someone caught his eye. Hey, guys, you go on ahead, there's something I need to do first. Yeyurazu frowned. If you're sure, Izuku. Come on, everyone. Midoriya waited until they were gone, and then he followed after his teammate. Bakugo, W wait up. Bakugo looked over his shoulder and glared at him. What do you want, Deku? Midoriya paused. What did he want? IG guess I just wanted to th thank you for following the plan, he said. Bakugo scoffed. It wasn't a shitty plan, and I got to blow up all might. Doesn't mean we're friends now, moron. For some reason, all the anxiety Midoriya felt at talking to his former tormentor vanished with those words, and a simple truth clicked in his mind. I know that. I'm not even going to try, because even if you worked with me today, you don't deserve it. Now it was Bakugo's turn to pause. The hell does that mean? Midoriya frowned. You don't remember, do you? What you said to me, during our last year in middle school. I said a lot of stuff, nerd, I'm not gonna remember every little. You told me to kill myself. Those six words made even Bakugo's eyes widen in surprise. He clearly didn't remember. You told me that if I wanted a quirk so bad, I should take a swan dive off the roof and hope I get a quirk in my next life. Bakugo said nothing, though it looked like he was trying to find the words. Friends don't say that, Midoriya continued. And it took finding real friends to realize just how horrible you were to me. You and I are never going to be friends, and I think I can live with that but at least now I can be in the same room with you and not be afraid. So, thanks, I guess, at least you taught me not to be scared of you anymore. Finally, Bakugo scoffed again and turned around. Whatever, at least you grew a spine, nerd. And I don't need to be your friend, like those worthless extras you hang out with, we're here to be heroes, not get all buddy-buddy. I don't see why we can't have both, Midoriya said, and walked away. See you at the summer camp, and thanks again. Bakugo waited until Midoriya was out of earshot before saying anything. Yeah, you too. Iri didn't really understand what the exams were or how important they were to the teenagers, but there were two things she did understand. 
First, everyone was excited to go to this summer camp, even if two of them had failed the test. Second, it meant that two weeks would go by before she would see her favorite people. See can I go with you? She asked pitifully as she sat in Uraraka's lap. Uraraka felt her heart clench, and she hugged Iri tightly. I'm sorry, Iri-chan, we'd take you if we could. But she looked at her friends helplessly, silently asking for their help. Thankfully, Yeyarazu came to the rescue. She sat next to Uraraka and gently ran her fingers through Iri's hair. Iri-chan, the police and the heroes still don't know enough about the bad people. For now, you should stay here, where it's safe. At the mention of the bad people, Iri buried her face in Uraraka's shoulder. On her other side, Midoriya took the little girl's hand. Don't worry, we'll come back, he promised. The day we get back from camp, you'll be the first person we see. Iri blinked away tears and nodded. Okay, Bashido smiled widely at her. And we can always talk to you on the phone. Horn buddy. As always, Iri glanced up at her own horn, and then at Ishido's, before nodding. This time, though, the students all swore they saw the corner of Iri's mouth twitch upwards. Was that a smile, Iri-chan? Midoriya asked. Achako, do you think that was a smile? I think it was, Deku-kun, Uraraka said teasingly. Come on, Iri-chan, I'm sure you've got an adorable smile, just waiting to come out. Iri's mouth wobbled, and almost became that same nervous smile that Midoriya often had, but it fell short at the last moment. I'm sorry, she whimpered. I just can't do it. That's okay, Midoriya said. You'll smile when you're ready. When you are, save a smile for us, all right. Iri nodded. Okay. She looked up at them. Will you really call me when you're gone? Of course. Uraraka hugged her again. As many times as you want. That seemed to settle Iri's nerves, and she slid off Uraraka's lap, but only so she could squeeze between her rescuers. Thank you. Midoriya and Uraraka looked down at the girl, and then at each other and blushed. They were aware of just how intimate this was, but they didn't dare protest. Iri needed the comfort and security they provided, and they would give it. They did wish their friends would stop taking pictures, though. Inko had been over the moon upon learning that her son had passed the exam, and dinner was almost like a small party. She had bought some extra dessert earlier, either as congratulations or a consolation, but she was glad to know it would be used for the former. I'm so proud of you, she said for the tenth time that night, and I'm sure you'll have a fun time at summer camp. It's not just for fun, mom, Izuku said. We're going to train really hard. I know, but don't let that stop you from enjoying yourself. Inko paused. Speaking of which, I have a surprise for you. Then, who had been enjoying the atmosphere, if not the food, raised an eyebrow. Did you get him a car? Because I think Yeyarazu wants to have everyone driven around in a limo. Ben, what? Ben grinned at Izuku. You know she's got, like, six. And they're all in different colors. No, it's not a car. Inko cut in as she pulled her phone into her hand from across the room, dialed a number, and then set it to speaker mode. Hold on a second. The phone rang twice, and then a familiar voice spoke. Hello? Izuku's eyes went wide. D-Dad. Hey there, kiddo. Hisashi's voice was a little uncertain, as he always was around the sun he barely saw. But it was warm. I heard you had a big exam today. How did you do? I passed. Izuku normally didn't boast, but he wanted to share as much as possible with his father. I had to fight all might during the practical exam, but I still passed. You had to fight all might. Hisashi now sounded on the verge of a panic attack. Are you okay? W well, I got knocked out at the end, Izuku admitted, and I took a few bad hits, but after I woke up, I turned into swamp fire, and I was fine. Izuku and Inko had explained the Ultimatrix to the Midoriya Patriarch not long after getting the watch, and Ben had even chimed in a few times. Hisashi had been amazed, and though he had seen some of his son's transformations during the sports festival, he had said more than once that he wanted to see them in person. That's good to hear, Hisashi said. I respect All Might as much as anyone else, so I'd hate to yell at him for hurting my son. Dad, Hisashi, Inko said calmly, wasn't there something you wanted to say to your son? Oh, right. Hisashi chuckled nervously, and Izuku could almost see him scratch the back of his head, something Inko often said he'd passed on to his son. Izuku, how would you and your mother like to see me in person? Izuku jumped to his feet. You're coming home. No, sorry, I still don't know when I'll be back. Tell me, do you know what I island is? Of course, Izuku said, though he couldn't help but feel disappointed that his father would still be out of the country. It's an artificial island that creates some of the most cutting-edge technology on the planet. They mainly focus on support items for heroes, but the founding members are the reason why climate change was fixed, and why even third-world countries have energy reserves. The island's security is supposedly as good as Tartarus prison, and there's never been a crime committed. There was a pause on the other end of the line. 
I should have known you'd know that. Anyway, I Island holds an expo every year to showcase new stuff, introduce upcoming inventors, that sort of thing. They also have a lot of heroes visit, either because they're interested, or as guest speakers. Izuku knew this, but he wondered where Hisashi was going with this. But there's also a preview of the expo the day before. It's usually for VIPs and celebrities. The reason I'm telling you this is because I won a contest at work, and I got three tickets to the preview and the expo. I was, I was hoping you two would like to spend the weekend with me on I Island. Izuku glanced at his mother. Inko was waiting for his response, but it was clear that she wanted to go. I'm definitely going, Izuku said. I can't wait to see you, Dad. Izuku could almost hear Hisashi's smile. That's that's great to hear. Oh, before I forget, there's this cool law on the island people can use their quirks, and heroes can wear their costumes, even though they're not on duty. You could talk to your school and see if you could bring your costume with you. And I'd love to see my son as the hero he's turning into. As sure, Dad. Izuku tried and failed to stop the tears from falling. We'll see you next week, a teary and co added. We love you, Hisashi. I love you both, Hisashi replied. See you soon. After a brief, awkward pause, the call ended. So we're going on vacation? Izuku asked. Inko smiled. Yes, sweetie, we're going to see your father. And all the cool things at I Island. Izuku grinned. I can't believe we'll see all the new releases before even the press. I wonder if any heroes I know will be there, or if. As Izuku fell into a storm of mumbles, Ben grinned. His young friend had come a long way since first receiving the Ultimatrix, and it looked like he'd be going even farther. The next day was an easy day for Class 1A, mainly focusing on reviewing the written portion of the exam. Some of the students, like Kaminari and Ayama, had barely scraped by. In particular, the former's failure during the practical exam meant that he was now firmly at the bottom of the class. He had practically begged Bakugo of all people to tutor him he explained that he needed someone who wouldn't pull any punches. To the surprise of everyone, Bakugo accepted, on the condition that Kaminari understand that he would, as Bakugo put it, beat the shit out of him during training if he complained. After school, Yeyarazu pulled the other rising stars aside to talk about something. Whatever it was had clearly left her conflicted, and that had everyone else worried. Everyone, have you heard of the I Island Expo? Only Yuraraka hadn't, but Midoriya quickly filled her in, and then Yeyarazu continued. Well, my family owns a great deal of stock in several companies there, so we get tickets to the Expo, including the early preview. I wanted to invite all of you with me, but I could only get five tickets to the preview itself. She smiled weakly. I was still able to get eight tickets to the expo itself. It includes plane and hotel tickets, so none of you would have to worry about much. Midoriya was very careful not to jump when Ben appeared in front of him and only him, since no one else reacted to his presence. Dude, please mess with them. It'll be hilarious. Midoriya wasn't one for pranks, but in this case, he thought he'd go along with it. I don't need one, Todoroki said suddenly. Endeavor always gets a couple of tickets to the preview, but he never goes. I can bring a guest with me. He decided not to mention how upset Endeavor was with him that he'd failed the practical exam. But Todoroki had managed to get the tickets because there were rumors flying around that All Might was going to the expo this year. All Might didn't leave Japan very often anymore, which had Endeavor suspicious. His son was given the tickets, in exchange for telling his father if he found out anything. He had no real intention of following through on that task. He'd just say that All Might evaded him, just like he got away from anyone he didn't want to speak to. Ashido jumped well into his personal space, bouncing up and down. Me, me, I wanna go. Todoroki looked her dead in the eye. Okay, sure, it's a date. Everyone froze and stared at him. Ashido, normally unruffled by anything, turned an interesting shade of lilac, and one could almost see smoke tricking from her ears. Date. What? Huh? What? Her head tilted from side to side, as if trying to physically force Todoroki's words through her brain. Finally, Todoroki smirked. It is fun to mess with you. Ashido scowled and smacked his arm. Not cool. Todoroki shrugged. I mean, if you want it to be a date. Ashido hesitated for half a second, and then smiled. Sure, why not? It could be fun. She then looped an arm through his and grinned at the other girls. They just scored the hottest boy in class. I'd argue with that, Yuraraka said, but half of Shoto's quirk is fire. Midoriya raised a hand in half-hearted protest, but then accepted Yuraraka's joke. It was made easier when she gave him a quick hug. We should still check in with our families to see if we can go, Eder reminded them all. But I do not think I will have a problem getting permission. Yeah, my parents are pretty chill about stuff, so I think I can go, Siro said. Ribbit, my brother and sister are going to be jealous. Asui smirked in a way that only teasing siblings could. That's their problem. 
as long as it's safe, I think my parents will give me the okay. Yuraraka didn't mention that, since Yeyurazu was providing the tickets, it would be easy on her finances. Well, that still leaves someone as the odd one out, Yeyurazu said. What about you, Izuku? Actually, you don't have to worry about me, Midoriya said, channeling as much sadness as he could into his voice, hinting that he couldn't go at all. The others all drooped. Oh, Deku-kun, Midoriya shrugged. I mean, I'm already going. Seven pairs of eyes stared at him, and seven voices spoke as one. Wait, what? Midoriya explained the conversation he'd had with his father the night before, as well as how he rarely saw the man in person. After he was done, he and his friends finally realized that they would basically all be going on vacation together. This is gonna be so cool. Siro elbowed Ida. I can't wait to see all that awesome stuff on I Island. Indeed, Dada said, some of the most cutting-edge technology is developed there, and we will be among the first to see the latest work. He bowed to Yeyurazu. Thank you for this opportunity, Momo. Yeyurazu blushed. It's nothing, really, I'm just glad that I'll be able to spend time with you all. Well, most of us, Ribbit, Asui said. If Izuku isn't with his dad, he'll probably be with Achako. Yuraka blinked at her. Wait, what? Ashido rolled her eyes. Girl, you two are gonna be in a beautiful island resort. If you don't have some romantic dinner or something, I'm gonna be so disappointed. Now the couple blushed. It hadn't occurred to them that a three-day weekend might be a chance for them to do anything romantic. Now that it had, thoughts rushed through their minds, and they found it difficult to look at the other. Siro chuckled and fist-bumped Ishido. Too easy. And it never gets old. Iyurazu rolled her eyes, though she couldn't deny that watching Midoriya and Yuraraka get teased was still funny. Well, now that that's settled, the plane takes off next Friday morning. Oh, speaking of trips, we should all make sure that we have everything we need for the summer camp outdoor clothing. Insect repellent, that kind of thing. Ashido's eyes sparkled. Does that mean what I think it means? I think it does, Ribbit. Asui smiled. I think it means we're going shopping. The boys of the Rising Stars suddenly felt nervous. Should we be worried? Siro whispered to Todoroki. Probably, the other boy said. But it's too late for Izuku and I. Sure enough, Ashido still had her arm around his, and Yuraka had a firm hold of her boyfriend. Save yourselves. Ben cried dramatically from inside the Ultimatrix. Before it's too late. It was too late. Sir, the latest reports you requested. Thank you, doctor, that will be all for today. All for one waited until his oldest ally left the room before perusing the papers in his hand. Shigaraki would be making contact with the first of hopefully many subordinates over the next few days. All for one was content to let his successor do as he pleased, for now. He would only step in if the young man was about to make a terrible mistake. Seeing as how that appeared unnecessary at the moment, he turned to his own projects. Wolfram had confirmed that his operation would be going underway in a week. All for one wouldn't be upset if the man's admittedly ambitious plan failed. But if it worked, it would certainly brighten his day. There were other, minor updates Gigantamasia had gone into another brief hibernation. But his location was secure, and those subservient to all for one were still paying their tribute to the ruler of the criminal underworld. In terms of business, all was going well. That left his personal project. He had little hope of anything changing, but it was something he did almost every day, and watching the UA Sports Festival had renewed his enthusiasm. Rather than waste precious energy walking, all for one rolled his wheelchair into the elevator and went down to the basement. Technically, the actual basement of the building was where he conducted his Namu experiments, but he'd had the second basement built long ago. No one, not Kirajiri or Shigaraki, not even the doctor, knew about this secret. The boy has to be connected to you, he said to himself as he wheeled into the small laboratory. I was almost positive when I saw his different powers, but the symbol on his watch confirms it. Sitting in a mechanical cradle on the other side of the room was a large machine. It looked like a sphere inside the corners of a box. The angular parts were a dull silver, while the sphere was a dark green. Once, the machine had been completely unblemished, but decades of tinkering, of disassembly and reassembly, had left it covered in welds, scuffs and dents. Several sections remained open, with long cables connecting the innards to banks of computers. Like always, the technology all for one had at his disposal was still insufficient to understanding this mystery. You finally made your move, have you? He asked, staring intently at the symbol on the front of the sphere. It was a black circle, with a white hourglass shape over it. Have you found a new champion, Asmuth? So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 8. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.